Can I please request everyone to take the, the front seats first, please? Come forward. If you probably need a, a, a table. Can I request uh, if someone who doesn't need a table to come forward, please? Take the front chairs.
ISDB, we ensure no one is left behind. We are one, facing unprecedented human challenges. One voice of many in this decade of action. Together, we can achieve our shared sustainable development goals and a prosperous future for generations to come. قصة النجاح اللي صارت وتعيش بيت التمويل الكويتي اليوم بدت من سنة 77 لما تقرر تأسيس أول بنك إسلامي بالكويت وبدأ منها تاريخ خطوات الثابتة لأهداف الأكبر ويكسب ثقة المساهمين والعملاء أكثر وأكثر وبدأ يكبر وتكبر معاه الإنجازات ويقود المؤسسات المالية في ابتكار وتنوع في الخدمات سواء اللي يقدمها للأفراد أو الشركات تعدى نجاح بيت التمويل حدود الكويت وبدت خطة التوسع لانتشار دول مختلفة في الوطن العربي وآسيا وأوروبا تحول من أول بنك إسلامي في الكويت إلى واحد من أكبر البنوك الإسلامية على العالم لأن بيتك عاصر جميع الأجيال ولأن بيتك يسعى للتطور في كل مجال يقدم بيت التمويل اليوم نقلة نوعية في الخدمات المصرفية الرقمية Farida, Farida, can you just close the door? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen On behalf of Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions and Islamic Development Bank I welcome you once again to the 17th Annual Islamic Banking and Finance Conference which is being organized on the theme, on the theme of economic resilience and governance in disruptive times. I'm sure all of you would agree that we had a very interesting session yesterday. It was a very good day where we heard a number of keynote speeches, a number of discussion points on various, um, various uh, angles in terms of economic resilience, on food security, on climate change, as well as we had the last session on how to integrate Islamic social finance into Islamic commercial finance. Alhamdulillah, we had more than 500 people pre present in this hall yesterday, and we hope that we'll have an equally good turnout today as well, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, we are thankful to all our speakers who have traveled far and wide to join us. We had more than 35 speakers for this conference. And we are thankful to our partners and sponsors who, without whose support this conference would not have been possible. Thank you to, to all of those who attended yesterday. And inshallah, we do hope that the sessions today will be equally good. Today we have, today we have four sessions, three before the lunch, and there is one after the lunch. The first session is on developing resilience um, it's related to Takaful. The second one is related to capacity building within the Islamic banking and finance industry. The third session is on Islamic finance windows. And the last session, the last panel discussion is on emerging financial technologies or fintech opportunities and challenges. We have with us a number of regulators, policy makers, and leaders within the global Islamic bank and finance to discuss these topics in detail. We also would have one presentation today on one of a very important project of AOFI related to alternative Islamic benchmark rate. Now before any further ado, 
let us begin the first session of the day, and that is developing resilience, the careful opportunities, challenges, and the need for inclusive reporting and disclosure. The chairman of the session is Dr. Bello Lewal Dunbata, Secretary General of Islamic Financial Services Board in Malaysia. I welcome Dr. Bello to please join me on the stage. Thank you. Our, our first panel, panelist for the session is Mr. Daryl Scott, financial cons consultant, former member of Inter in International Accounting Standards Board in the UK. I welcome you. Please join me on the stage. I also would like Associate Dr. Yusuf Dink, board member, Insurance and Pension Regulation and Supervision Ag Agency, Turkey, to join me as well. I IPRSA has also become a, a recent regulatory member of AOFI, so we're glad to have them on board. Our next panelist is Mr. Mohammad Kashif Siddiqui, an expert in insurance and the Kaful and works for Capital Market Authority in Oman. I also would like to invite the practitioner's perspective, and that's very important always, and it is Mr. Azim Pirani, CEO of Pak Qatar Takaful from Pakistan. I, I hand over to you, Dr. Uh, Bello, to carry on, inshallah, the, the discussions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rizwan. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the IOP uh, for this invitation uh, for me to be part of this important global event. I'm also very grateful to our council members who co-organized and hosted this event, definitely the Islamic Development Bank and the Central Bank of Bahrain who has been the council members of the IFSB and who has been steering our activities, who jointly support this event. So I sincerely uh, thank the, them as organizers. I would like to also express my sincere appreciation to all the IFSB members and IOP members here present because I, I'm sitting here as a board member of IOP at the same time also the uh, Secretary General of the IFSB. Now, having said that, yesterday we had a wonderful discussion very great sessions that we had uh, looking at, apart from the, 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 the guidance and the, the insight that were given by the keynote speeches, uh, I believe the session that we have on food security, on climate risks, as well as on uh, social finance has been very, very useful to addressing the conference theme. When we are talking about resilience, we are talking about economic development, uh, post-pandemic, geopolitical tensions. I think this is a very timely theme of the conference, and I, I think we have all the expertise here uh, that will be able to give us some important takeaways that we'll be able to use them as part of policy development as well as product development and regulation. Now, for our session, which is actually focusing on the resilience uh, of the Takaful sector, we try to look at the opportunities, we try to look at what are the challenges, and then being an IOP conference, we know that we currently have an issue with regard to the applicability of the IFRS 17. This is related to the presentation and disclosures because the uniqueness of Takaful sector is, is, is different because of its specificities related to Islamic finance. We have certain transactions that are not uh, particularly available and visible in the conventional insurance practice, particularly when we are talking about Qadr Hassan, they don't have anything like Qadr Hassan. We have issues like Waqaf, Islamic social finance, and even the models, we have various models of Takaful. Uh, there are quite a number of structures that we have which the conventional insurance doesn't have. So this makes this uh, discussion very, very essential, and we know uh, prior to the pandemic and the fourth industrial revolution, which is basically the accelerated digitalization of the global financial services, uh, the insurance company, including the Takafu, they do conduct due diligence, understand their customers based on the engagement and uh, discussion that they have. 
Now we have a big data that gives us the opportunity to understand customers that are not existing and a lot of opportunities that we believe with the big data the Takaful companies can actually leverage on and then the resilience of the Takaful sector in the contributing the economic development can be enhanced as part of the opportunities. Now, to discuss this, uh, for our session, we try to, as much as we can, we are pleased to have uh, a group of experts here who are very, very well experienced and they are practitioners in the Takaful sector and also in the development of uh, standards and policy. We, have, we are fortunate to have uh, uh, Daryl Scott here. So he is one of those behind the, the, the IFRS 17, so I'm just exposing you, Daryl, so that anyone can, can ask him questions as you wish, because he created and pioneered the IFRS 17 that created a challenge to certain jurisdictions whereby uh, Takaful institutions are requested to comply with the IFRS. Now, for this discussion, we have uh, in our session uh, Daryl Scott, who is the financial consultant now and a former member of International Accounting Standard Board, ISB, in the United Kingdom. We also have Associate Dr. Yusuf Ding, who is a board member and insurance, uh, at the Insurance and Private Pension Regulation and Supervision Agency, IPRSA of Turkey. We also have Mr. Azim Pirani, who is a CEO of uh, Pakistan Qatar Takaful, which is an, is, uh, uh, a Takaful, full-fledged Takaful uh, company that has been existing for quite a number of years in, in, in the Republic of Pakistan, Islamic Republic of Pakistan. We also have uh, Mr. Mohammad Kashif Siddiqui, who is a former regulator and currently still a regulator as an expert uh, in insurance and Takaful, working with the Capital Market Authority in the Sultanate of Oman. So we have quite a range of experts in this panel and uh, I believe with the topic of today where we are trying to look at the, the, the opportunities, the challenges and then what are the, uh, the need that we have in having an inclusive reporting for the Takaful sector compared to the insurance so that the Takaful uh, company's financial statement can be comparable and can be assessed uh, by the investors and those the users of the financial sector so that they can make a reasonable sense so that they are not at a disadvantage. Now, our session will definitely focus on uh, one of we are talking about the opportunities and the challenges. We all know Takaful has a lower penetration rate compared to the other segments of the Islamic finance industry. Uh, based on the IFSB stability report, if you have the opportunity to download that, the Takaful sector still constitutes 0.8% of the total global Islamic finance asset as of 2021, which means out of 3.06 trillion US dollars that we have, Takaful is only 0.8%, which is about 24 billion US dollars. And this is really of a concern. Even though we have leading jurisdictions like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Sudan who have the insurance sector to be 100% Takaful, we still have this lower asset size. So we would like to understand perhaps in this session uh, why this lower penetration rate and the lower in terms of asset size, this is something that we are all interested, even though the, uh, the IFSB stability report also highlighted the year-on-year -year growth for the Takaful sector is 4.8%. So, so, but that 4.8% is not like actually moving at the speed that we are expecting at the industry. Now, the second aspect of the discussion will focus more on the, the innovations and accelerated digitalizations that give room for opportunity to grow the Takapal sector. This is something that we feel that is very, very essential to be discussed, and especially we have the regulators, we have the market players who are Takapal operators in this, in this panel, and then lastly we touch on the financial reporting and disclosure aspect. Now, let me start with perhaps Darren. Uh, I mean, as someone that is, uh, you are involved, both conventional and Takaful, you are now a consultant, you are involved in Takaful, you have been involved in insurance for many, many years, all your life, and then this lower penetration that we, that, that we see in Takaful, what do you think, whose fault do you think? Is it the regulators or the marketplace? Are the regulators not providing the relevant 
regulatory framework that will serve as an incentive to drive the industry forward? Or is it the, the Takapula operators that you think they are not really doing their, putting the efforts to, to, to really drive the industry forward by coming up with quite a number of, you know, uh, uh, financial literacy and awareness as well as new products in the industry? Who's faulting you, do you think? Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for that question. So, I always say you should never introduce me as the father of IFRS 17 without first showing me where the emergency exit is. Um, and I think now you're also asking me to blame one half of the audience or the other half of the audience uh, for, for the difficulties. Um, I think, as you mentioned, I spend a lot of time working on conventional insurance and with Tuckerful Insurance, and most of the time I spend working at the moment is with emerging economies, and I'm drawing a lot on the emerging economy experience. So I think the starting point really, when you're thinking about penetration of insurance products relative to other Islamic products or other financial products, the starting point is to understand that you are trying to sell to a market that very often in the emerging markets doesn't particularly believe in the product that you're selling. That belief comes from a couple of things. It comes from the fact that emerging markets tend to have a higher component of community cohesion. And so insurance product is a product where you need to be bailed out of a problem, you need to have a problem solved for you. In, uh, in jurisdictions, in emerging markets with social cohesion, what you find is you first can look to your family, then you can look to your community. Very often you can look to the religious organizations or institutions around you to help you. And so for many people in emerging economies, insurance is in front of mind because there are these other parties you can rely on. Um, I think also people don't necessarily see insurance as, their, as, as a want-to-have type of product. It's what I've often referred to as a grudge pro product. What I mean by that is nobody in this room wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I really want to get an insurance product. It's not something we get excited about. Banking is exciting because banking allows me to obtain an asset that I wouldn't otherwise be able to obtain. Or it allows me to use my card in various places. Insurance doesn't provide any of that. Insurance is also probably the only product in the world that we buy and hope we will never use. Because the nature of insurance is typically you don't want the event to occur that you bought the insurance for. And that means that if you are in the space of a insurer, be it a conventional insurer or a tuckerful insurer, you have to be very aggressive in the way that you present your product, in the way that you educate your market, in the way that you get your name out and your, your, your message out to your market. And that, I think, is an area where we see both, in emerging economies, both conventional insurers and tuckerful, in, tuckerful uh, organizations being slow to move and I think where there needs to be a lot more activity happening. But then I think the regulators also share some of the blame, so I'm not just going to blame the, the, um, the Tuckerful operators themselves. Regulators, by their nature, favor market stability. You want a stable, strong market. You don't want any excitement. You don't want any challenges in your market. And so that means you tend to favor the existing incumbents over new entrants. You tend to favor the big balance sheets over the new startup balance sheets. You tend to favor the big brands over the smaller brands. And a lot of regulatory structure is built around favoring uh, working with the bigger names and not working with the, with the new entrants. Thank you. So what, 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 what do you think of the market players? Do you think they have played their role? Because, I mean, it's good that you highlighted is about the belief and the consumer behavior, basically. They, people doesn't really feel the necessity go for the couple and the regulators are focusing more on the stability and resilience of the industry rather than, you know, uh, pushing the, the, the product forward. So, I mean, is it because the, the, the market players or the couple operators are, are doing, do you think they are doing what is expected of them? They are doing enough? I think, I think certainly couple operators can be doing more. I think they should be doing more about lobbying governments, lobbying regulators to make sure that they are given the appropriate space in the market. But maybe even more importantly, I think they should be doing more about educating the market to understand where and how insurance products or how these sort of um, uh, standby products actually operate. And I think it's interesting that in a lot of emerging economies, 
uh, insurance type products really get their start when you have compulsory products introduced like, ins like vehicle insurance and the like, and even pension products. Because what that does is it gives people the opportunity to understand an insurance product in a situation where they need to have one rather when the, than when they need to actually go and make a decision on their own to do it. Well, well, your final comment on this uh, question. Well, um, you are engaging with the Chicago so far, the Chicago that you have engaged, the market players that you have engaged. What do you think that the market or the Chicago operators should focus on in order to drive the penetration? Education of the market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darrell. Uh, perhaps uh, we now move to regulator. Uh, perhaps if you agree with uh, what Darrell has, uh, has mentioned, I will uh, start with maybe perhaps uh, Mr. Muhammad Kashib, uh, who is an expert in Takapul and now working with uh, the Capital Market Authority of, uh, in, in Sultanate of Oman. Have the regulators met the industry's expectations in pushing the greater the couple. You had just what Darren just has said. Just said. So I don't know, what's, what's your perspective and take on that? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Mr. Bello. Uh, actually, you know, the regulator, the regulator's responsibility is not to regulate and supervise the industry only. The ultimate responsibility also to promote and develop the market. So, uh, but you know, uh, Mr. Darren very rightly said, is actually as a proactive approach, the industry has to come up, up front first, with their models and their channels and their awareness program, and and behind the scenes, the regulator are in a supporting in a supporting manner, so that they can give the level playing field for the for, for to the market and and to regulate in a way that there must be some resilience available in the market and and to have a uh, clear transparency in the reporting. That's how the regulator can support. And not only this, for the Takafu market, regulator has been supporting in many different areas. For example, we know that there is a awareness is really a challenge. Because uh, in, even in the Muslim populated countries, we see the lowest penetration even. So why people are believing that uh, because of the faith that the insurance is not permissible under Sharia. So, but the, the council awareness is not there. Otherwise they can have a, you know, a higher take up in, the, in that country. So uh, what the regulators can do, and in many jurisdictions we, we see that the regulator has announced window takaful operations. Actually, what's the uh, idea behind that? Because the insurance companies have already a setup around uh, around the globe, and also in a, in a, those remote areas, even where the where the new entrance the couple cannot approach. So it's a better idea to allow windows so that it will create a market through awareness program. And uh, Mr. Azim Prani, you and the couple, he is he just. I'm not sure whether Azim is agreeing with yeah, what you are saying, but, but, but I maybe perhaps you, you can learn your points. Uh, yeah, actually, you know what happened? Why he might have a disagreement in the way the window should be allowed first before they allow full fledged companies. Okay, but uh, in different countries, it happened that the full fledged companies are announced upfront and then later on the windows are announced. Actually, windows are announced. Indonesia did the right thing. Actually, they announced the windows and they give them some time to close so that the every company must be subsidiary as a full fledged Takafu company because awareness is already created. So, the regulator has to plan actually. Uh, I mean, windows, allowing windows has a lot of concern, especially we, we, we had in a number of jurisdictions. One hmm. of the most recent jurisdictions is actually Turkey. Yeah. So, where the, the, the conventional insurance, they have so much advantage over the, the couple operators because they have a wider number of branches, yes. more capital, yes. more, more human uh, and, uh, resources. Know, and resources, as well as they have greater efficiency in terms of the quality of services that they have. Mm -hmm. So when you allow them to open windows, definitely they will take and eat all the market share that the, the couple operators currently have. So that has been a concern in, in a number of uh, jurisdictions. Now, what we are saying, or the question that I'm asking you, whether you believe the regulators have done enough with the expectation of the industry, compared to the, because you mentioned education. Yes, education is very, very important. But is it the reg, are the regulators really pushing the education on Takapu? Or is it not what they are not pushing because it's not their responsibility alone? Yeah, for instance, I have been working with the Pakistan regulator. I developed the Takafu rules there. So we tried to put some through regulation. For example, we made a compulsory training sessions 
within the couple and, and for the market as well that they have to create awareness through you know windows also and uh, uh, ultimately the windows should not be long forever they have they must have some time period to stop so that, that they can take up all the matter with the full fledged takaful company and not only through windows there are lots other areas the the, the operators has stepped in for instance in because the large capacity is not available in takaful okay so sometime to promote the takaful companies where they don't have uh, the re takaful coverage available sometimes they will allow them to go for the reinsurance so that at least they must have some takaful companies businesses there for the large risk and not only this uh, in some countries we have allowed the window re takaful as well for example in sultan of oman just couple of months before we have issued a one framework so that not for the companies they can allow window but we allowed the window re takaful operation so that to create the capacity so that the takaful company can earn benefit out of it so that if there will be large capacity available in the market so that takaful company can run more businesses otherwise the the the, the player is, the, the policy holder will see that okay the the financial capacity with the takaful company is not that much so let to go with the conventional so if the capacity will be there so it's our responsibility as a regulator to create the financial capacity and the soundness and you know the regulator has been Uh, in order to create a uh, confidence of the participant and policy holder we are enforcing so much legal issues for example uh, legal compliance issues for example sharia governance framework it is very important so the customer can be satisfied that yes in the name of sharia this company is running and operating in a very sharia compliant manner so we develop a sharia compliance governance framework which requires the uh, Sharia, uh, Sharia board in the regulators level, in the companies level, Sharia external audit and Sharia compliance officer. This is all governance framework for the uh, Sharia compliance. And um, uh, not only this, we are uh, you know issuing many kind of the other regulations. For example, to create a financial soundness, different type of the solvency now nowadays the risk based solvency regime linked with the capital with the capitals adequacy. And also we are in, we have introduced so much uh, about the. Um, uh, a minimum capital requirement so that the financial sense of the company should increase so that the financial capacity can build in the market we are trying our best but mr dalil rightly said it's actually first the operator has to come up and then they need support and for that purpose we are very much open to listen to the market and we are very much happy to listen and and act upon it to to support the industry and but they must do you know some lobbying yeah rightly said by dalil <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much uh, brother kashif i think The, the dilemma, from my own understanding, because in the past we have conducted a number of research on Takapul, and the dilemma that the Takapul operators usually have in terms of pushing the consumer education and financial literacy related to Takapul is that they have a dilemma whereby are they going to use their shareholders' funds or they are going to use the Takapul operate or holders mm -hmm. policy holders' fund. Mm -hmm. So, because conventional insurance, you know, you are buying a premium, so you you own this funds so it's it's like they can go any to any extent and promote this uh, you know mm -hmm. so the education part is something that i i believe the regulator should come in as well we we don't have issue in terms of the infrastructure related to uh, regulatory frameworks supervision frameworks and guidelines mm -hmm. that's quite robust in many jurisdictions mm -hmm. but i think as darren highlighted it's more on the consumer education who are the customers for them to be able to come forward and drive the industry forward But maybe perhaps Mr. Azim, you are a market player. You are the CEO of the Takaful, a very important Takaful uh, institution in, in, in Pakistan. So, whether, did you agree with uh, what Brother Kashim is saying, or you have your own opinion on this? And why do you think uh, why can't the Takaful operators take the necessary steps to bring a more need-based kind of products that will drive the industry forward? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. So, um, I, I agree with uh, both Daryl and, and Kashif to the extent that yes, uh, the Takaful operators need to do more. Obviously, it's in their direct self-interest to do more. But let's be, let's be very honest. Um, the vast majority of the Muslim world is, is are developing countries. Uh, most developing countries have extremely low penetration of insurance or Takaful. It doesn't matter which one we're talking about. They're both in the same boat. Uh, so um, I'd like to use Pakistan as an example because that's something that I'm working in. And it gives you an extreme situation of how bad it can be in terms of that penetration. So when we started Pakata, 
we actually got a survey done to try and understand why people don't use insurance. Because we were the first uh, life takaful company, uh, the first general company had started uh, some months before us. So we got a survey done with some students to see where the problem lay. And we realized that the f most of the public, when you ask them why they're not using insurance, their reason will be that it is haram, and that's the end of their discussion. But when you would probe further and ask them, do they do banking, they would say yes. And then you would ask them, where do you have your bank accounts? And they'd mention the whole list of conventional banks. Then you would ask them, that, are they current accounts? Then they're like, no, no, those banks give very good returns. I have savings accounts over there. So you begin to realize that their reason for making uh, insurance haram has less to do with sharia as, as, a, as the root cause and more to do with the fact that they don't know why, why bother with this product. I mean, like you said, it's a grudge product. And in, 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 in many markets, it's actually, and unfortunately, our sales team actually says this. They say that, look, we're selling a push product. Nobody comes and asks for an insurance product. Like they said, you don't wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I'm going to get an insurance product. But you do wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I'm going to get that new Toyota Land Cruiser. Why don't you think about insurance that way? You do the moment you find out you're going to die in six months, or the moment you find out, oh, I'm going on a long trip, I need to make sure my spare tire is in the back of my car. So when something happens, it kicks in. And so eventually the survey found that the vast majority of people are either ignorant of the benefits, or they uh, just don't feel that there is a reason for them to go down this road. It's a, it's a waste of money type thing. In fact, when I joined the Takaful company, uh, my wife, who I would consider a fairly educated lady, she's a graduate, she's this and she's that, she asked me, why would you want to work in insurance? Nobody deals with insurance. And this is a English-speaking, you know, well-educated individual. Her example was, well, my father would get a policy every year and we'd never benefit. And I'm like, what if he hit the car? Then he would benefit. Well, nobody thinks that far. So the, in response to the whole topic, the, the awareness that is needed. Now look, for example, recently in Pakistan, we've had so many changes regarding AML, KYC, all due to the FATF initiative that the world was taking. Now over there, the regulator grabbed the thing, the bull by the horns and started pushing forward because they felt if we don't do this, this is going to cause a problem. If we don't increase the penetration of insurance, we already are living the problem. Most of the developing world, the government doesn't provide any sort of support for anything. Yeah, absolutely right. But, yeah. But, but, so, yeah. is insurance not a no-brainer? But who is going to tell them that? I, and I, the, the reason the regulator needs to be involved is because the regulator has that capacity, that power, that legal edge to be able to make these products bundled products or required products. So for example, any car financing done through a bank automatically has insurance or takaful on it. No brainer. So as Islamic banking goes up, takaful automatically goes up. Can we not do that for people's health? Can we not do that for their lives? Can we not do it for children's education? So yes, I as a practitioner, it's in my self-interest, I need, I'll have to use my shareholder funds because our Sharia board will not allow us to use the Takaful funds for marketing. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Brother Azim. I think for the audience, it's very important that how we drive the, uh, the Takaful penetration rates and increase the asset. I, I will come to you, uh, Dr. Yusuf Shatli. I think for the audience, just ask yourself, how many times you enter a car and you feel the necessity for you to put the seat belt? but you don't really have, feel the necessity to have an insurance or a couple. So I mean, this is just a question. You answer it yourself. Because at the moment you enter a car, you want to put a seat belt. But when someone talk about a couple, what's your response? So, so I leave the, 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 the answer, you answer yourself on that. Now, uh, Dr. Yusuf, how can we increase the penetration rate? Assalamu alaikum, thank you. Hello. 
Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank to you for having me. Uh, it is great pleasure. And I want to touch upon a bit uh, on Daryl's uh, discussions. He referred to stability. Yeah, it is important, but uh, we should learn how to make money from instability. Otherwise, resilience will never come to us. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the stability is kader, uh, natural phenomena, but instability also. So we should uh, learn how to make money in both positions, and then the resilience will come. If we cannot make money during these uh, disruptive times, instable times, then we can never uh, see the resilience. So uh, another thing, uh, Azim said, why we cannot uh, sell uh, health insurance. We cannot sell because our distribution channel, uh, uh, it is a distribution channel issue. Yani, uh, yes, the couple increase, it is penetration with the increase of Islamic banks credit uh, penetration, yani, because the Tekafil companies use uh, Banka Tekafil for their distribution channel. We need to uh, uh, change some things, change the game in distribution channel. We need to have some technology abilities, and this comes from conventional mainly, then transfer to Islamic. We should be leading in some cases. Another thing is awareness. Uh, all uh, our uh, brothers mentioned, uh, yeah, it is issue. As one of the Islamic financial literacy scale developer, maybe first Islamic financial literacy scale developer because the previous studies are Islamic banking literacy scale. Uh, we see a fourth dimension different from conventional financial literacy scales, and we understand, understand this fourth dimension uh, uh, beside behavior, attitude, and knowledge is awareness. And uh, the regulator's role is important. Uh, when regulators regulate some financial product or fi uh, financial business, uh, the awareness of the society increases. So we need to increase this uh, uh, by regulating properly. And take off your companies should offer efficiency. Uh, new products of course uh, important, but many of us uh, doesn't have product development department. Many of us doesn't know even what is product development process. Uh, we have never thought about uh, in, uh, engaging Sharia bodies to the uh, product development process, and we have such difficulties we need to solve. Uh, it is another issue on the company side. Uh, but in any case, uh, new product can make huge change, yani, huge change. Ahmed Bey here, Kuwait Turk introduced gold account and it is another league uh, player now in Turkey. And, uh, but the uh, well-known products should be uh, offered efficiently. Without offering the well-known products, you, you cannot offer some new set of uh, products. Yani. Uh, so the, we need to increase the efficiency to increase efficiency, we need uh, all distribution channel improvement, uh, education of the uh, operator staff, education of the society, increasing awareness. We, we need all of this. The main issue is uh, behind the penetration rate is the efficiency problem, I suggest. And uh, for uh, increase the efficiency, we need a collaborative work from uh, government, from uh, regulator side, from company side, and uh, even the other uh, segments uh, ro uh, of Islamic finance, they can play a vital role uh, in improving tekafil industry. Uh, these are the uh, issues for penetration rate. Uh, I can uh, ex uh, refer. Uh, thank, you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Yusuf. I think you have uh, also, in a way, summarized the key issues that will drive uh, penetration rates and increase the asset size. One is the change of distribution channels, the, uh, the idea of having a product development uh, focus department to be able to develop more products and services, as well as the collaborations among the regulatory and supervisory authorities. And of course, education. It's, it's all about education. I'm sure. I mean, I, 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 I 
so it's, it's like just a, a, a kind of job. Someone was saying that you want to sell insurance, sell it when, sell it to the passenger, passengers on a plane. When the flight is going into turbulence, then they will easily sign up, <laughs> right? That's, that's really, I mean, it's, uh, it's weird, but I, I, I think it makes sense, all right? So, so I mean, as a, as a takeaway for this particular round of discussion, looking at how do we increase the penetration rate, I think uh, these are very, very important points that we have highlighted. Now, moving forward to innovation and accelerated digitalization against the increasing need for creative product and distribution channels that you just mentioned, uh, Brother Yusuf, uh, youth and technology as an opportunity for Tokapul. Now, maybe perhaps I'll start with you, Brother Azim. Given the strong accelerated implementation of technology across most of the Muslim world, uh, and why do we not see the same implemented in, Taka, in our Takapul, uh, perhaps, uh, products and distribution channels? Why we don't see that? So, um, uh, many jurisdictions, the regulators have set up small sandbox or incubation centers where they're encouraging insure tech startups to, to provide those sort of ideas. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it is still very much in its infancy in that we haven't really seen the proof of the, the pudding in, 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 and because we've never really been able to taste it. It's never really been effectively implemented yet. Uh, but people are working on it. It's not like they're not. Uh, it is something that we're moving towards. But again, it comes, if, if you look, I mean, I know a couple of companies in Pakistan on, a, on their private level tried to implement uh, digital insurance, small ticket products, you know, based on a scratch card or, or, or something along those lines, it didn't really work out. And maybe it's before it's time, maybe it's still some years away, but because people were not really inclined to want to buy it, nobody bought it. Um, maybe if it's bundled with something else, you know, so let's say I, I know a company in Pakistan that offers consumer financing for motorcycles and mobile phones, small ticket, not very large, not very expensive items. So they wanted to provide a protection element to their, uh, to their borrow, uh, borrowers. So they came to us and we offered them a natural death product that they could bundle. And when they heard the price, they're like, no, 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 we, we can't afford this. Give us accidental only. So we gave them accidental only. Again, they were like, well, okay, this is, this is not too bad. Then when we offered them telemedicine, which is a living benefit, again, bear in mind, I'm not going to die, I don't need to worry about that, but what do I get while I'm alive? So when we offered them telemedicine, again, for a very small cost for the whole year, for the whole family, they were like, over the moon, this is like great. So again, it comes down to that same element of we don't value protection as highly as many developed countries do. Uh, and even in developed countries, I was just discussing with Dara last night, I mean, uh, insurance is not something that, you know, you really care about per se. It's just something, and because in most Western countries, you already have your state-provided protection, it, it usually suffices. So it, the, the concepts are there, the initiatives are there. Like I said, it, it's maybe it's before its time, at least for most developing markets. But it is something that you will eventually start seeing. Uh, we've already got, at least in Pakistan, we've already got mobile phone companies offering very small, they'll give you a call on the spot, 50 rupees, X amount of cover. Again, is the person buying it because the lady on the other end sounds very nice and she's pushing it? <laughs> or is he buying it because he genuinely needs mm -hmm. and realizes he needs that product? That's where that awareness gap basically comes into it. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I totally agree with you in, in, in that uh, respect, but I think the, the issue is, it has to do with a lot of initiatives and innovation from the Takapu operators. They need to come forward. They need to engage as well, not only with the regulators, but as well with the government. Because we all know that it is made mandatory in all jurisdictions before you renew your vehicle license or road tax, you must take an insurance. So, I mean, I think this is the kind of push maybe perhaps that the, the, the market uh, players should maybe initiate and engage with the government and, and, and push some of this, uh, some of this uh, component. I mean, the governments are as well looking for money in this recovery times. So it will be good maybe to initiate some kind of policies where the government will, will have some, some, some benefit in it by reducing 
some of their expenditures, or maybe in taking uh, in healthcare and, and so on, when this when the the citizen take this some of these policies. So I think these are some areas that I think uh, can be looked at. And then I think what the industry want to see is that they want to see the Takapul operators coming forward, moving forward uh, to, to, to push some of these things. Now, why do we, uh, in terms of the innovation, uh, Brother uh, Kashif, what, what, what do you think, what should, what should we do? Um, actually, Mr. Azim rightly said, um, because this is not the you know, psyche of the people to buy insurance product by their own will, until, unless they don't see there really a need, okay? Uh, and, and need must be, you know, in a forceful future, right now. <laughs> Otherwise, they cannot wait for the long to have a claim. Um, but but you know, as compared to the, you know, the Islamic capital market products and the banking products, insurance product has different aspect, actually, you know. Um, whenever there is a bank branch, okay, many, many individuals go to the bank branches to have the service, okay. But do you think that the people go directly to the branches of the insurance company to buy a product? Very likely. So very, very unli unlikely it happens, actually. Why? They need a push. For example, if it is a mandatory product like the health and the motor, people can go to the branches to see the, to the prices of different, different you know, uh, companies, and they, they, have to buy actually, they have to buy, actually, to comply with the laws and regulations. But for the, for the life products, let's say, they have to buy for their own, in, in, uh, for the saving or the, for the protection, they need a push. So that's why we feel that the life product is mostly sold, you know, through the agents, brokers, and the sales staff by pushing the pushing the person. There are several meetings done with the, with the potential clients to engage one person. So, so it means if we go for the innovation, innovative products will not attract the customer directly because they are they don't see the need. Okay, they need a push by the uh, human face-to-face -face interactions. So these actually things. Uh, little bit, you know, slow down after COVID. When did they realize that there's a real need of the systems, and the people cannot couldn't go outside to buy the products or something, and they started to use the system for their offices and okay, meetings. Then they realize there's a need of the systems and innovations. That's how there are some trends. And uh, uh, for example, in in Oman, we introduce uh, when you know we control the pricing of the mandatory products of the health and uh, and and the, and the motor. For the motor especially, we have put a condition that, okay, for the each type of the policy, and with respect to the different body, body vehicle type, we, we put a minimum and maximum pricing. And, you know, if company want to compete with each other, they might have to reduce the price, but nobody can. So we, in, we give a one 10% discount you can give to the customer, okay, if you are selling your policies online, either through website or other mobile application. Now we see a lot of uptakes. So I think that's kind of thing we should introduce something in the market. How we, actually we are not giving this 10 percent discount at the cost of the company because they will save the broker commission, agent do, commission do, out of do it. Do you think it's high time that we start bundling capital market products like Sukho with insurance like for the underlying assets as well as for the banking products? And I think these are some thoughts that I think I have, which I can share with the panel. If is it the right time that we start bundling some of these Islamic banking, Islamic capital market products with insurance? so that the underlying subject matters or assets that are in these mm. transactions mm. are forced mm. to be taken insurance? Could it be one of those? Yeah, it might be a solution. For example, in order to promote the takaful, the, the capital market regulator and the Islamic banking regulator can also introduce one thing, that, that all the Sharia compliant underlying assets should be secured through takaful, and also the, all the Islamic banking and their windows, their own assets should be mandatorily covered under takaful, and also the customer's assets. They, f they cannot force, but they encourage to d to go for the takaful coverage. Okay. Thank, so thank you very much. I think, uh, uh, Daryl, what's, yeah. what's your take with regard to the opportunities and the advantages that you think the TO have at this uh, accelerated digitalization time in the post-industrial revolution era? So I think, I think the opportunities are huge. And I don't think the opportunities need to be brand new. I think there's lots of opportunities to copy. In some of the discussions we've had, I mentioned that the interesting thing about emerging markets is that what you tend to see is generational jumps. Most people in emerging markets have a cell phone before they have a car. Uh, they have a cell phone before they have a, a, a nice house. They prioritize those types of things. So this is an example from an emerging market from South Africa. My watch, my Apple watch, my health provider bundled it and gave it to me for free. 
but it's not for free. That is the purchase price to buy the data that my health provider gets from me. Now they know how many steps I walk each day. Um, they know my heart rate. They know how much sleep I get. And they can incentivize me to act differently. They can charge me differently based on my health profile. The same insurer then comes to me and says, all right, you've, you've got the health product. We'd like to offer you a car product. And we will put a tracker in your car. The car measures how fast I drive, how safely I drive, how much I break and how much I don't break. It's giving them data again that helps them fill the picture about me. When I have a claim in South Africa, I don't go to a panel beater. I take a photograph of my car on my cell phone and I email it to them. When I have a claim on my health insurance, I take a, f a photograph of the bill and I send it to them. They're doing everything without personally having to see me, everything based on a technology platform. And now recently what they've done is they've taken all of that data that they have from my health policy and all of the data that they have from my vehicle policy and they're trying to sell me a life policy because so now they understand my life so use data and use mechanisms to get that data so you expect the Takaful operators to leverage on this data I think it's a system that Takaful operators can copy from other parts of the world there's no reason there's nothing that is uncopyable in that model and I think there's no reason why it shouldn't be why Takaful operators shouldn't be able to access it as easy as everybody else excellent uh, Dr. Yusuf, what's your expectations for innovation in Takapun in the next two to three to five years? What uh, do you think do you do as, as a regulator? What do you expect to see coming forward if we are to, to, to really uh, tap into the opportunities that we have? What I would expect to see is uh, the change of the marketing strategy. Okay. Uh, there is an old fashioned marketing strategy in Islamic finance industry to market their existence. Okay, we are Islamic, yeah. Uh, what, why I should use your product? Because I am Islamic. Uh, okay, but this strategy is already consumed by Islamic banks. So there is nothing left for take off. Uh, and still Islamic banks are uh, using the same strategy and take off started with the same, but we need to shift this. Uh, the most innovative attempt would be shifting to a new marketing strategy with the products and the efficiency, I guess. So the uh, climate is changing, the risk is, risks are increasing, and uh, the variety of risks are also. Uh, so we need to understand the trend, and we need to adapt our businesses. And if the couple can do this, uh, can lead the Islamic financial industry as well, and we can solve a problem that uh, many of the Islamic finance countries are bank-based economies, so with the, with the lead of Tekafel, we can have a capital market-based uh, Islamic financial industry at those economies. Then this would lead uh, the economy shift to a better, uh, well-developed economy level. Uh, so I want to emphasize those, uh, but uh, we are working uh, in Turk Turkey, we are working on some proper uh, uh, innovative products, uh, but uh, to uh, mitigate the risk against this uh, change, uh, the climate shocks and other issues. We need to change all the uh, structure of all uh, the products. Yani if we are offering uh, some uh, like motor uh, insurance, we need to consider if it is electric car or some other car. If we are uh, offering a premium level for uh, a company with uh, uh, carbon footprint score is high or low. Uh, so this would be cons should be considered when uh, calculating the risk premiums in the, and uh, Tecafo can regulate the real industry by this way to shift, uh, to, to push them to shift to uh, uh, decrease their carbon emission and uh, their other uh, environmental uh, problems. Yeah, yeah, I think you, you raised a very important point. Uh, I mean, climate risk, disasters, mm -hmm. and uh, these are all important areas, which I believe in the past, before the pandemic, there was a real focus and discussion on the, the use of Tokapul for focus-based financing for disaster recovery. I don't know, was, was, uh, the, the, what do you expect to see in that? Do you expect to see that discussion coming back to the table 
or a more greater focus on that. Sure. Area. If if we can manage this, if uh, these uh, tech offer operators or any other insurance companies can uh, uh, motivate the companies to decrease their carbon emission, then the whole other risk at the other side will decrease as well. So the loss potential of the insurance companies and tech offer operators will decrease. So we should uh, use uh, these uh, climate issues as a leverage to decrease the uh, upcoming uh, crisis, upcoming risk, and upcoming loss for uh, tech offer operators. It, is, it should be on the agenda. Uh, and uh, ve very uh, recently, uh, you know, uh, Turkey introduced TOK electric vehicle. So we, we are studying on a project to offer lower level uh, uh, premium uh, uh, pr product for those cars. Yeah. Okay. I think we are fortunate to have uh, the, the Director General of the Islamic Development Bank mm. Institute here with us. And I, I believe they are working on a number of research areas on Takapul related to climate change. I, I hope this discussion uh, will give the opportunity for for ISDB to, to hear from us and then to take on board some of these feedback that we are giving. I think these are very, very essential areas. Yes, climate change, uh, disaster recoveries and uh, initiatives uh, involving Takaful are very, very essential. And I think uh, ISDB is already working on that area. Mm -hmm. I think hopefully maybe in a future discussion we'll have opportunity uh, in the next conference to discuss in more details on that. Now, coming back to the, I mean, to the last part of the uh, discussion on the session, which is basically the need for inclusive reporting and disclosures. This is an accounting discussion, and I think it is, we can't, uh, this is uh, an IOP conference, and this is very, very essential. We already have, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a challenge in the industry uh, by the revised or the new IFR 17. So, so it's, it's quite challenging that uh, in certain jurisdictions, the regulators requested the couple operators to report based on IFRS. Uh, in certain jurisdictions, the regulators require the couple operators to, to report based on IOP standards. So now we have the opportunity to have Darrell, and we, have, we are all IOP, and we would like to hear uh, perhaps uh, from Darrell, can the couple industry adopt the IFRS 17? And if not, what are the issues and the challenges that you think need to be overcome for them to be comparable or compatible with IFRS 17? Thank you. And I think, I think it's just worth picking up something you said before I start on 17. Uh, we're talking about resilience. One key element of resilience is transparency. And particularly in the insurance industry, understanding that the insurer is going to be there, the tuckerful operator is going to be there when you need the product to pay out is critical. So transparency of reporting, whichever form format you use, is a critical element, I think, to, to resilience. IFRS 17, can it be used? It is certainly been applied by a number of countries successfully from, from the processes I've seen. Can, can be used or cannot be used? Can be used. It has been used by a number of countries, in a number of countries, uh, for their Tuckerful industry. The Tuckerful industry has worked through the process and they believe that they can comply with um, IFRS 17 and comply with the requirements, the Sharia requirements that over, over, overlay that. But I think the most important thing here to say is that Tuckerful is not the same in every jurisdiction. Tuckerful products, we tend to talk about it as though it's one thing but it actually has multiple different strands to it, multiple different elements. And I think it's not appropriate for me even to say that it could be equally applied in every jurisdiction. What I think needs to happen is regulators, accounting um, professionals and others within each jurisdiction need to have conversations, need to be talking to each other, need to be understanding those elements of um, their tuckerful industry that are more complicated. IFRS 17 is principle-based. That usually means you can make it fit most of the situations that you, that you need it for. But an example you mentioned earlier, CARD is a good example where there are complexities applying IFRS 17. So understanding those complexities, talking about them, and ideally resolving them is critical if you're going to actually apply the standard. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I, think, I think it's encouraging for that remarks from you. And it's very realistic because the 
a couple of models vary from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, we, we, we had challenge at the IFSB in, in categorizing the, the model that is being practiced in Turkey, for example. This, this is a totally different model uh, that they have. Now, uh, uh, Mamar Kashif, as a regulator who is involved also in IOP uh, standard, you know, IOP has been uh, trying to come up with uh, standards that is well encompassing and that is uh, in line with the IFRA standard. Uh, do you think the TACAPL operators, uh, particularly the TACAPL fund, that is required to uh, comply with, uh, to apply IFRS, will be able to apply the, the upcoming IOP standard? And what is the status of that IOP standard at the moment? Um, actually, you know, the very first time IFRS 17 is issued for the insurance accounting, before it was IFRS 4, which is not for the insurance accounting, actually, it's only for the presentation and certain disclosures. So it's the very first time the ISB has issued a particular standard for complete, comprehensive accounting and reporting for the insurance. And uh, uh, obviously, um, but I believe that uh, IFRS framework is built without considering the Sharia compliance issues and, uh, and without considering the model of Takaful itself. So I don't think so that the, if the company is complying 100% IFRS, they can, they can claim that they are adhering to the to the AOP standards or, or compliance standards as the, the couple model itself. Because there are a lot of differences. For example, if you talk about the IFA 17 particularly, and uh, why it cannot be saying that it is compliant with the Sharia compliance, the model is different because the contract is totally different. In the IFA, is an insurance contract, which is a remunerative contract, where, where in, in the Takaful, the contract is, rem is non remunerative, is based on tawarr or donation. And because of this science, actually, the whole model shifted from different man, in a different way. For example, the reporting style is different in, as per the IFRS 17 and, 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 and the IOP. new phase, AOP, um, where, you know, the structure of the model says that the shareholder fund has to be kept separate with the parchment funds. So shareholder fund is, can only deal with the shareholders' money and their investments, but the parchment fund can only be used for the purpose of the takaful operation specific to that. And the reporting is different, and there are some internal, you know, relationship that the, the, or the shareholder is managing the parchment fund on the basis of some operator fees. These elements are missing in IFRS 17. And for instance, they are, they're not only the direct, direct issues relevant to the couple contract, there are some elements which the FAS is covering. For example, the requirement of the Karza Hassan is there, okay? But the IFRS doesn't talk about the Karza Hassan, where, where and how, and there is a need for the payment testing as well in the shareholder fund when the Karza Hassan is provided to the parchment fund. And also there is one concept which is called HIPAA from the shareholder. This kind of the concept is not available in the IFR 17 standard. And there are also a thing that, okay, if the shareholder is going to establish one takaful fund, they, they have to send some seed money. How to deal with the seed money is also missing. And, uh, and, and there are a lot of actually, uh, for example, reporting style. Now under the EOF affairs, we, are, we have been asking that not only the institution or the operator's level financial statement has to be produced, the fund which they are managing, this is parchment fund by the shareholder is as a managed fund. They have to report it separately. Their financial position, their activities, they have to report it separately. So there are a lot of differences in the IFR. And not only this, for example, in the calculation side, if you go for the calculation of the CSM, uh, we say in Takaful it is Takaful residual margin. Okay. In the, uh, in the CSM, we built all the expenses with the, with the company is bearing to in, the, in the future cash flows, okay, to have a net present value of discounted value. So there are two issues. First of all, the expenses. Which expenses need to be taken care of by calculating TRM or CSM? In the, in the insurance, we take all the general expenses, commission, whatever. But in the parchment fund, it is not allowed. Because IFR 17 is relatively to be applied, particularly in, IFR, in the uh, parchment fund mainly. And there's a, one expense which is called vakala fees. Vakala fee can be inbuilt in, in the CSM calculation, but not, or TRM calculation, but not the all expenses and commission. So there's a lot of difference in the profitability and the technical serving side. And discounting is also one of, the, one of the issue under Sharia. On all the libraries, we cannot, we cannot uh, allow the discounting factor. There are some issues because under the Sharia that if, if there's a one receivable which has become then, then you have to settle by this amount, you cannot discount it. Okay. So, so, so in, in a nutshell, the, uh, the IOP pass is, is really, really robust. Very, very, yes. exactly. So I mean, I would like to echo, I totally agree with you as, uh, I, as a member of the account, IOP accounting board. I believe the IOP has taken all the necessary steps 
in ensuring that the Takapul operators have no worries to, uh, they, they don't have any worry when it comes to compliance with the, with the IFRS requirement because all the specificities related to, uh, to, to Takapul operations, the IOP, the new standard of Takapul has taken care of that. And we believe uh, it's not in divergence uh, with the IFRS standard and I believe the, the standard will be a great uh, uh, and uh, useful one and it will really promote the, 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 the uh, transparent and prudent presentation and disclosure for the Takapu uh, institutions. I would like to add one more point. For example, in those, those jurisdictions where only IFRS framework is applicable, where they did not apply the AOP standard previously, how they did actually, because for example, Pakistan, Malaysia, and U Uganda recently issued you know, Takapu uh, accounting regulation for their Takaful. Uh, accounting guidelines. Malaysia has issued accounting financial uh, financial accounting uh, uh, guidelines, and UAE has issued financial regulations, and uh, Pakistan has issued all the accounting regulations plus accounting formats for Takaful. Those jurisdictions which are mainly FRS compliant and they have not adopted the UFI standard, they are they are covering up through the regulatory regime. Okay. In most of the countries. Yeah, I, I mean, adopting IOP standards or IFSB standard is a secret. Some come out and say that we adopt the standard. Some mm -hmm. doesn't come out and say because they took the standard, we made our standard yes, yes. free, readily available on our website. So they will take it, copy it, use it as a policy guide, uh, yes. as a basis to develop their policy. So yeah. actually what we, uh, either in IOP uh, uh, footprint reports or in the IFSB uh, implementation report that we issue, Normally, we underrated those uh, jurisdictions or the numbers of those that adopted our standards. Hmm. Because some take the standards and use it as a guide to develop their policy hmm. without coming to public outrightly and say that we are using IOP standards in, in developing our own policy. Yeah, yes, David, you want to just, just one, one additional comment on that. And I think, I think it is very important that the ISB and IOP work somewhat hand in hand. Um, a lot of what you've mentioned there is complementary to IFRS 17. So it helps you better apply IFRS 17. And I think in the perfect world, it will be absolutely awesome if you can be compliant with both. Yeah, and that people acknowledge that. Yeah. Sometimes there are things, and card is a good example, discounting, as you mentioned, is a good example, where you can't be compliant with yeah. both, you one or the other. But for most of these situations, you can, in fact, be compliant with both, and that's a complementary process. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's why we have greater coordination with even ISB. Uh, they are, both IOP and IFSB are all members of the Islamic Finance Consultative Group for the uh, ISB. Uh, and then we share our own views, and then uh, we, ha we have meetings, and then we look at what are the issues that they, they, they have. So I think we, there is a greater coordination of that, and we, we, this is just to make sure that this Islamic finance institutions, certain jurisdictions whereby they are mandated to apply IFRS, then in that case they don't have much issue and the divergence is actually being reduced to a minimum. Now, uh, Brother Adam, in terms of presentation and disclosure uh, requirements in the IOP upcoming pass that will be soon be issued, are these different from what you are currently, uh, uh, you know, implementing in related to IFRS 17 or maybe if you are already uh, 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 implementing the IOP pass, then what's the difference that you think it will be costly? There will be some additional uh, cost element in terms of apl application of the standards? Um, so, at least in the, in, uh, again, because every, as you rightly mentioned, every jurisdiction is, is, is going to be working in a different way, and, and even the GAFL models are different, so there, are, there will be differences there. Um, just picking up the Pakistani example, uh, we're currently going through uh, the implementation of IFRS across the board. Uh, it's sort of a regulator come down on insurance, the CAFL, everybody. Uh, granted, those questions are there that we were you know, discussing yesterday about the, the waqf pool and, and how to manage all of these. Regulator does not have an answer yet. Um, we are hoping, and in fact, it's, it looks uh, fairly strong that they will be implementing uh, AOF standards for the Takaful company, so that will make our lives much, much easier. Uh, you know, we can move forward, and as it was rightly mentioned, they fairly complement each other, and that way we can then uh, not have to deal with the, uh, the issues that are coming into that. Is it going to be costly? Uh, <laughs> yes, um, because as we were discussing yesterday, uh, IFRS 17 is so uh, 
360 degree in affecting every aspect of our business. Uh, we are literally expecting to have to uh, bring amendments to all our business systems, uh, many of them imported from other companies in Malaysia or here or there. So we're expecting to get a fairly fat bill uh, by the end of the of, of the whole process, so it's not something we're looking forward to, but obviously it's something we will have to do eventually. All right, next issue. I mean, with regard to the financial statement prepared under uh, Barre 17 and mm -hmm. IOP standards, uh, do you think it will be comparable at the end of the of the day? Uh, as okay. a regulator, do you expect them to to ensure that the if they adopted IOP standards, it must be comparable with the IFRS 17. Do you want to enforce that? Uh, first, as, as of 1st January, these Turkish uh, takeoff companies, insurance companies will implement IFRS 17. Yeah, but it is more comparable compared to IFRS 4. Yeah, and it is better, it makes me happy. But to implement the IOP uh, standards, we need to uh, set the model first. Uh, the issue is model uh, uh, compliance uh, to the IOP standard. And you mentioned Turkey used to apply a different model. Uh, it is uh, removed now. It's good uh, that you said used to. So yeah, used it's to. no longer uh, effective when? Alhamdulillah. And our presence here is to uh, let you know this and to increase our uh, uh, compliance with IOP standard uh, to increase our collaboration because Turkey will be the fastest growing takeoff uh, country in the next year. Four new takeoff operators are coming. And uh, already Red Takeoff company established, established. it is a uh, state-owned company. It has strong uh, uh, ties and strong capital. So uh, it, we will change the game in uh, Turkey. We want to have a uh, uh, at least uh, leadership in at least one segment of Islamic finance. It is very uh, difficult to make it in uh, banking, uh, but in Tekafel we can succeed it. At least if we can be a leading country in one of the segment uh, with our both market share and compliance, then uh, we, w we can change the game, inshallah. But uh, that is important what I am uh, uh, expressing that both market share and compliance not market share we are not on that side anymore we are more on uh, Sharia compliance side okay. uh, for now but uh, we believe that will take us to the market lead inshallah Th thank, thank you. you very much thank, thank you our, our time is over I'm not sure whether uh, the doctor Rizwan is here can give us just five minutes we take Q&A all right okay are we given some you have a question all right, so we will allow for like uh, three questions, if possible. So we have the, uh, Brother Omar, yes, doctor, and then one more. Okay, one from, so these three questions. So we can take three questions because we don't want it up to the time of the next session. So that, I mean, so maybe pr perhaps, uh, can someone give the mic uh, to? Uh, I think it, I should be the first one. <laughs> My name is Kamran Shirwani uh, right, okay. from ADCB Islamic okay. Banking UAE. Uh, first of all, Mr. Danbata, uh, you said that uh, we should offer takaful while there is turbulence on the flight. While no, no, I did not say so. Okay. I said it's a. I would focus on <laughs> istighfar at that time. Okay. Uh, so I'm just asking that: uh, is there a role which uh, the standard-setting bodies can play towards the uh, product development, which eventually results? Uh, improvement as far as the disclosures are concerned. Yeah, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, first, let me clarify what I said I saw as, uh, in a social media clip. Someone was promoting to say that we sell Takaful while the flight is on the tumbler. So it's not Dr. Dambata that said that. <laughs> so to clarify that. Now, uh, in terms of uh, product development, I think in, this, in the case of the IFSB, we have since 2018 introduce what we call innovation forum uh, and the most recent one that we had was in Doha this year uh, in this forum we try to promote innovation and discussion on new initiatives related to across the all the three sectors and I, I, I believe uh, a lot of uh, market players are regulated uh, uh, benefited from that and at the end of the day we also published the precedence for this innovation forum and we'll publish it in the IFSB website 
So I think we, I would like to, to recommend that we see more of this forum being established. Maybe perhaps I hope you can have our own or we can have it jointly for the industry uh, to have more innovation discussion. As I mentioned, I mean, just now during the discussion, I was just thinking why can't we start bundling Takaful to ICM products, to cook products and Islamic banking products that maybe the assets need to be take, given insurance, then we should make it as a condition. If we want to really drive the asset and the penetration rate, the asset size, and then we need to start bundling Takaful into some of these uh, products. So I think this is something that I think we can, we can be looking at in the nearest future. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Billo, and actually it was very enlightening discussion. Uh, I, my mind is like, you know, we have been thinking this thing earlier, and today it was discussed again about the size and the growth. So actually I have a comment which converts into a question. The comment is that the banking regime also have capital adequacy requirement, insurance regime has, uh, you know, capital adequacy, minimum capital and solvency requirements. But the, uh, the banking has some ease, like, you know, some sort of uh, support is there from the regulators as well as, uh, like, you know, from the system. So for example, if I'm a small bank, and I can, I, 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 but I can still take deposits because then only for the purpose of maintaining my car, I will have to put that into zero weightage or minimum weightage assets. Like I can take as much as deposits as I like and I can put them in Sukuk. Your, my capital adequacy will be there. You don't put a bar on me. I don't have this facility available with regard to insurance. Yes, you can say, okay, you can go to Rita Kaful. How much? How many Rita Kaful are there? What is the size available? I'll have to go to conventional. So the point is that uh, here we have got a, like, you know, a natural constraint which is much bigger than banking that I do not have a facility to enhance it. Now, even on the, on the banking side, you have deposit protection scheme. Actually, regulators are running the deposit protection schemes and insurance. But on insurance side, the Kaful side, you don't have anything like this. So my question is, what needs to be done by the regulators together to find out as a system that how they can provide some equal level of opportunity for Takaful to grow without getting into that significant issue of solvency? Maybe by creating the common pools or something for creating resilience, and that, is, that, that, is, that can help. Again, it, I know it's a long comment, <laughs> but the question is small. Mm. How regulators can help the Islamic, uh, the Islamic insurance or the Kaful to increase the size without significantly putting the capital? Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, Brother Kashif and uh, Dr. Yusuf should respond to that. Yeah. Yes. Actually, the risk with the banks and the insurance is totally different. In the banks, what we get the money as a deposit, we have the only limited liability. But in the insurance, we get the premium of only 1%, and we have the 99% multiplier risk effect there. So we, we, have this, we need to have a solvency level. There are two kinds of the, actually, the capital level. One is the minimum capital, and one is the solvency level, uh, solvency capital. So minimum capital is just for, to have a startup, to invest in the system, and the people, and, uh, and to write the policy, and uh, as a startup level, to, to initiate a transaction. And, but this risk-based solvency is actually based on your risk exposures. It can be overcome through the good reinsurance coverage or read the coverage coverage through the good ratings. Actually, for example, uh, in this year, March 2022, in Oman, we have introduced a risk-based solvency capital. Previously, it was one line formula and every company has to comply with this. Either the company is small, either the company is big, they have to comply with the same amount of the capital, uh, your capital and the solvency capital both. But this time, we have totally changed the regime. If you're a small company, you need a small capital. And if you're a large company having the good exposure with the risk, then you have to have a larger risk capital. So that's how we are managing. And there we are giving them question, if your reinsurance coverage are so good with respect to the, uh, the high rated Rita re for reinsurance companies, your effect on the risk is less. So that's how we are managing. But if you compare with the banking sector, it's a totally different ball game. Up till now. And also the risk exposures. Hey, brother, you want to uh, yeah. Pooling, state uh, supported pooling is a good solution. We have such experiences on the motor insurance, disaster insurance, and agriculture. Uh, in this uh, model, all the uh, takeoff operators are uh, gaining their commission fees. That's all. Uh, but 
the risk uh, goes to the pool and the pool is supported by the government. What is the issue in Turkey? <laughs> but there is issue in Turkey. Uh, some of the, those pools doesn't have Islamic window. So we are just establishing those. All right. Th thank you very much. All right. So maybe you and the lady there. That's, that's all. Th thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bello and the panelists for this uh, very insightful session. Uh, my question is related to, you know, development of the takaful sector. Uh, I, I'm from the ISDB. Uh, most of the member countries, you know, the takaful companies, they focus on motor takaful or live takaful. We find that there is an issue with the agricultural sector, whereby the, this is not really covered by takaful companies. I would like to know whether there is an appetite to offer agricultural takaful and perhaps also micro takaful. Mm. And, you know, what could be the challenges and what do you think, I mean, us, I mean, the ISDB could do to encourage, you know, uh, uh, the, the takaful, you know, industry to promote, you know, agricultural takaful to support the agricultural sector. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. That's, that's a great question. I'm coming to you. That, uh, uh, Brother Azim, I think you can take this question. Just to add to your point, actually, it's not only agricultural sector, but as well trade financing. Trade financing has been a great volume, and then there has not been much involvement in the Takaful sector. Maybe perhaps a Takaful operator would like to hear your views. Do you have such kind of arrangement for agricultural financing? I mean, agricultural Takaful, as well as maybe uh, any other initiative that you think is coming to your mind at the moment? So, <clears throat> on the agricultural side, of course, um, uh, wherever a financial institution is involved, whether it's with trade finance or any other requirement that, uh, let's say, an organization is picking up bulk agricultural produce, uh, they will obviously inevitably go with a requirement that we need coverage for these goods. Now, whether they're on the, in the ground still or they're in a warehouse, there will be some level of coverage that will be required. Um, unfortunately, at least, again, uh, taking Pakistan as an example, which is a pr predominantly agrarian economy, and very dependent on its agriculture. If I were to ask that, does the, the, the farmer or the landlord at the very onset look at getting any sort of protection? My answer would be no. But yes, the moment there's a financial institution involved, yes, the, the protection automatically becomes a requirement. Um, again, it, in, as, as Brother Omar rightly mentioned, that there's often an issue of retakaful capacity available. Uh, for agricultural produce, because again, the, 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 as Brother Kashif mentioned, the, the rates are really small, but when the claim comes, it just goes, it, everything goes completely haywire. Uh, and the floods we saw recently uh, were actually an eye opener, and, and so many of the government departments, as well as brokers, were now actively getting involved recently. The, uh, the President's Secretariat, along with the Federal Insurance Ombudsman, actually did a workshop on agricultural protection schemes. So they invited the insurance sector as well as the takaful companies to come in and participate. So uh, unfortunately, due to the capacity constraints, takaful companies are often a little on the, they're not as aggressive to get that business, whereas ideally they should be because that is probably what the market would want as well. But again, um, and again, just on, on a side note, where it comes to takaful capacity, re takaful capacity, sorry, uh, a country like Pakistan is often at the receiving end of the, of, of the, of the stick because uh, our currency is constantly going down. That company is obviously allocating capital for that protection for us. So when they finally get their re takaful premium, they're like, you know, what's this? And so the rates then go up and, and their reluctance to work with us goes up. It's not that they're not there, it's just that they're not as willing to be a part of it. So the schemes are there, but pay probably not at the level that ideally they should be. Yeah, but, but thank you very much. I think uh, we, are, I, we, are, we, you, are, we are really running off of that. If you allow me one point to add yeah. in this. Uh, actually in Oman, we have been uh, receiving so many issues from the parts band that we don't have the full coverage available with the every insurer about the agriculture insurance. So we make it mandatory that every insurer must have the agriculture policy, okay? Now what happened, in the full year time, only less than 10 policies was issued. So still, I think there's a need from the, from the participant side, they have to come up. Product is available. 
So, so in order to increase the penetration for this and coverage, I think the parchment has to come up. Okay, thank you. Uh, sister, let me place your question. Salam alaikum. Yeah, I'm coming from a jurisdiction where Takaful is new and um, the conventional insurance are made to adopt IFRS 17. Uh, what's the fate of the Takaful companies in my jurisdiction with respect to IFRS 17 adoption? And then I also want to ask what are the standard setters IFSB and IOFI doing to accommodate uh, the uniqueness of Takafu so that maybe after a while, the Takafu company can also adopt IFRS 17. Thank you. Okay, maybe perhaps Darren, can, you can respond to that. So I think the, the important thing, when standards are written, any standards are written by the ISB, they are written on a principle basis. And the objective of a principle basis is two things. It is to call it open the door as widely as possible for any products across the range and it is to future-proof proof the standards so that new products that come along, uh, new innovations that come along can still be accommodated within that standard. Um, one of the things that is really important is getting feedback at exposure draft stage to allow the ISB to adapt its standards specifically for the elements like you've raised them now. So if there's something that you have a concern with at exposure draft level, you can raise it and it will usually be accommodated in the final standard. But I think the biggest thing for me is the principle-based nature of IFRS standards that allows a very wide latitude in the way the standard is actually applied. And I think that comes back to the point we had earlier about the IOFI standards generally being complementary. They help you apply IFRS rather than contradicting IFRS. Thank you very much. I I think we have uh, really exceeded our time, so I, I want to really thank the audience for your uh, engagement with, with, the, with the panelists, and let's give the panelists a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you have other questions, please feel free. You can engage with the, with the speakers after the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bello. Thank you. It's, um, I'm sure it, um, everyone would agree. It was a fantastic session. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I think we'll have a group picture, if you don't mind. While you do that, I would like to thank you once again for joining us for this very important session on Takaful, um, a, a topic and a, an industry that at times is not discussed um, during the, the conferences at length. Um, but thankfully, we are able to discuss it at least um, in, in one this session, and hopefully in the next sessions it will follow as well. So thank you very much, Mr. Daryl Scott, financial consultant, former member of International Accounting Standards Board, for joining us. Uh, Associate Dr. Yusuf Dink, board member at IPRSA, Turkey. Mr. Mohammed Kashif Siddiqui, an expert in insurance and Takaful, Capital Market Authority. And Mr. Azim Pirani, CEO of Pak Qatar Takaful from Pakistan. Thank you very much. Now, before any further ado, um, we would need to start our next session. We are slightly uh, behind time. And the next session focuses on the, another important topic, and uh, I think topic is of, um, uh, of interest to everyone involved within the global Islamic banking and finance industry when it comes to um, you know, passing, on the, the passing on or developing the capacity within the industry itself. So that the, the discussion will be around the need for capacity building in addressing modern challenges. Um, and uh, we have with us five uh, panelists and um, session chairperson or moderator. Um, we, I have the pleasure of inviting Professor Dr. Humayun Dar, who is the chairperson of the, of, the, of the panel, to please join me on the stage. I would also request uh, Her Excellency Ms. Maisa Sabrin, first deputy governor, Central Bank of Syria, to please join us on the stage. Uh, Mr. Firaz Hamdan, Member Accounting and uh, AOF Accounting Board and Executive Director of Human Resource Development at Bank du Liban, Central Bank of Lebanon. Dr. Aishat Muniza, Member AOF Public Interest Monitoring, uh, Monitoring Consultative Committee, as well as Chairperson at Capital Market, Advisor, uh, uh, Capital Market Sharia Advisory Council at Capital Market Development Authority in Maldives, as well as she is a professor at NCF in Malaysia. I'd also like to invite Dr. Muhammad Bilal, research economist at research and for research and regulatory affairs at Sibafi um, in Bahrain. May 
there are translation kits available outside as well. If anyone would need, please uh, uh, request either one of the colleagues. And we also have uh, Dr. Sayyid Nazim Ali, uh, Director of Research Division, College of Islamic Studies, uh, King Ham uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University from Qatar. A well-known personality within the global Islamic bank and finance industry. Um, somebody who has contributed immensely within the, uh, within the research and academic fronts and the advocacy in particular. Thank you very much. I, I hand it over to you, Dr. Humayun, for, um, for the session, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam wa ala sayyidi al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'i. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When I was at Lakhra University, we had one professor. Uh, he would be there outside the lecture room where he would be having his next lecture five minutes before uh, his slot. And if the lecturer or professor who was in the classroom would not come out one minute after the, uh, the start of the period, he would go in. And I actually felt like doing this thing today as well. But out of respect of all these uh, wonderful speakers, I restrained myself. And of course, if I had done it, if he would not have invited me. Uh, I think of, you know, the, uh, the topic we are going to discuss, Sharia governance, uh, the need for capacity building in addressing modern challenges. This is a very important uh, topic for Islamic banking and finance. And capacity building is actually important for any industry. It's uh, a lot more important for Islamic banking and finance because this is uh, relatively still a new industry. Uh, we keep on boasting uh, of 50 years, 60 years of the industry, but still I believe it is an infant industry in a lot of markets. Okay, there are some countries where Islamic banking and finance is only about four or five years old. Of course, in Bahrain, the history is uh, quite long, and so is the case in other GCC countries and in Malaysia, uh, Pakistan, and a lot of other, other countries. Uh, I was recently in uh, Ethiopia. So there, although Islamic banking and finance uh, was allowed in 2011, 2012, but in, uh, and of course, uh, some conventional banks started offering Islamic banking and finance, but it was in 2018 when Islamic banking was allowed in the country on a fully fledged basis, which means the industry in its uh, full form, it's only about four or five years. So infancy is an issue for Islamic banking and finance, which uh, necessitates uh, capacity building uh, uh, to take the industry to not only the next level, but next levels. To discuss uh, this issue, AOFE has done a wonderful job by requesting uh, a wonderful panel to discuss uh, uh, to, to share their ideas and thoughts with me and, of course, with uh, all of you. Uh, given that we are already late, I would like to uh, just mention the names of the uh, panels. Of course, my name is Humayu Dar, and we have Her Excellency Ms. Maisa Sabri, uh, first Deputy Governor of Central Bank of Syria, and we have Mr. Firas uh, Hamdan, member AOIF uh, Accounting Board, and Executive Director of Human Resource Development, uh, Bank de Liban. And Professor Dr. Sayyid Nazim Ali, you know, we are meeting after quite a few years because of COVID, and I'm so very happy that you know, he is uh, with us today to uh, be part of this panel. Uh, he is uh, a professor and research director uh, at Hamad uh, bin Khalifa University 
uh, in Qatar. Dr. Aisha Muniza, she uh, is one of the distinguished uh, ladies uh, uh, featuring in our Women I report. You know, we have a Women I report comprising uh, profiles and uh, uh, information about leading women in Islamic business and finance, and Dr. Aisha Muniza is uh, one of the leading ladies. Uh, she is uh, also a member of uh, AOFE Public Invest Monitoring Consultative Committee, and of course she is an associate professor at UC. Dr. Muhammad Bilal, uh, research economist uh, at, uh, at Sibafi, and his area of focus is on research and regulatory affairs. So it's a distinguished uh, panel. I would like to uh, uh, start the conversation, and this would be a conversation. And uh, this uh, would be not just conversation between me and the panel, but rather I would like to invite the audience to be part of this conversation right from the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't like you to wait till the end when we would like to uh, open question answers. Uh, there is already one hand up, and I would uh, like to use my authority to ignore this one. Uh, however, there is another one, other hand, uh, if you could introduce yourself and uh, tell us what do you want us to discuss. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. So a couple of things from my side to, I mean, for, the, for your kind consideration and the respected panelists. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the capacity building, uh, I think uh, uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, because I, uh, my, my name is Zafar Abidin, so, and I'm a part of Sharia advisory team, ADCB. So I have studied uh, in traditional uh, uh, education system, Darul Ulum. So what I find the challenges for the people coming from this uh, uh, education system that they, get, they don't get access to the industry easily. While I, my understanding is they are very qualified, but they need certain type of uh, training and orientation of, uh, of the industry. So I think that also need to be discussed uh, as part of uh, this uh, I mean, a discussion. All right, thank you. I think one is enough. Okay, so oh, sure. let's, uh, I think Sharia governance, okay, this is something we are going to discuss anyway. And I would like to start with uh, maybe Muhammad Bilal, with you. If you, uh, considering this question which has come on the floor as well, uh, can you start the conversation by sharing your views on Sharia governance? I have got my own views. I would share with you later. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and a very good morning uh, to all of you. Thank you for the kind introduction also. So, um, as, as we know that, uh, coming to your question before that, as we know that capacity building has been always very uh, key for the Islamic finance uh, industry growth. And uh, in my opinion, if we see the considering uh, the recent trends and also the challenges, especially in, in wake of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I believe that capacity building has uh, become even more important for the growth of Islamic finance industry. And as FC have rightly pointed out, that in, in order for us to take the industry to the next level, this we really have to focus on capacity building um, for the, our industry. So uh, before going to the uh, question of uh, Brother Zafar, uh, I would like to uh, point out two things which, uh, in my opinion, if uh, Islamic finance industry is going to focus on, so it will really help us to take the Islamic finance industry to the next level. One is the area of sustainability, where many people, they also understand it as uh, sustainable or responsible finance. And uh, also, some they are considering as, uh, as ESG practices also. The other area, uh, this is one, the second is on uh, financial technology or fintech. This is another very important area. But before uh, going to the fintech, um, let me uh, give you a brief on the sustainability perspective. Uh, this is very important. We know that in the last couple of years, there is a growing awareness on this topic or this issue of sustainability. 
And uh, uh, we also know it's, it's true that in Islamic finance industry, this topic is still new, and we have a fresh debate on going on in this topic. But looking at the conventional side, they have been working on this area from quite some time. They have taken a lot of initiatives. We know that, for instance, uh, under Unify, uh, uh, they have issues. Uh, they have issued uh, principles of responsible banking, principles of responsible investment. And also, they have also come up with um, uh, various standards and also, I would say, like uh, different guiding principles. Uh, GRI is one example. Global Res uh, Reporting Initiative is so one, one example of it. And um, in, in, uh, at CBAFI, we are taking uh, s I mean capacity building with a lot of uh, emphasis on, on this area. Um, from last 15 years, uh, we are working on it, and we have uh, currently like more than 16 uh, programs uh, targeting on uh, capacity building. How many of these are on sustainability? Sorry? How many of these programs exclusively focus on sustainability? I was actually coming to this part because recently, as you know that um, in Islamic finance industry, um, I can give you a couple of examples uh, how we, uh, I mean, Islamic finance industry is focusing on sustainability. One example is from Malaysia. In 2019, the Bank Negara Malaysia, they came up with this sustainability principle. They call it principles of VBI, value-based intimidation. But uh, the scope of this, uh, these principles were actually uh, focusing on Islamic banking sector within Malaysia. But recently, CIVAFI, uh, we have released our CIVAFI sustainability, uh, sustainability Guide uh, back in uh, May this year. And uh, this guide has consisting of five uh, sustainability principles. And now in the continuity of the same project, we are working on developing uh, training modules and uh, capacity building workshops specifically on sustainability guide. Uh, why we are doing that? Because we believe that it is, uh, I mean, just issuing or releasing the principles or a sustainability guide is not enough. I mean, that is not going to uh, serve the purpose. Or for a bigger objective, we have to educate and train over Islamic finance professionals. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you on this one. Yeah. Actually, we run a program called Global Good Governance Program. And we have found that Islamic banks and financial institutions are far behind their conventional counterparts when it comes to governance. You gave example of this value-based uh, value-based uh, uh, intermediation, which might have some kind of uh, uh, relevance to governance uh, and capacity building. Aisha Muniza, because when you come from INSEED, and INSEED is under Bank Nagara, Malaysia, uh, so what kind of uh, relevance uh, BBI would have to governance and sustainability issues, and how the banks, especially Islamic banks uh, in the country, Thank you very much. Bismillah rahman rahim assalamu alaikum. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to have this important discussion uh, today here. Uh, with regarding the question, I think VBI has uh, created, um, I would say, a bit of um, a huge difference when it comes to the different types of um, Sharia governance that we had applied in the industry, different governance of, uh, can you hear me? Uh, sorry. It seems like uh, my voice is on and off. I felt so. Okay, so the thing is, VBA has created a huge impact in the society by linking Islamic social finance with Islamic commercial finance, which was there in the classical Islamic financial institutions. So meaning that the synergy we needed in the industry through taking a governance approach by having the VBI initiative in the market, we have come to a kind of a solution where we have tried to find solutions to create synergy between Islamic social finance and Islamic commercial finance. For example, let's say a few years back before VBI, we don't see any Islamic financial institute talking about Waqf or linking zakat or sadaqa to the mainstream of Islamic economics, I would say, or m it would be much more accurate to say to Islamic financial system. But now with VBI, we see a lot of opportunities as well as a lot of practical aspect of it happening in the market itself. Now let me cite one example. Uh, we have, the Bank Negara has come up with a fund called ITECAD fund and using this fund, 
we can give qarla hasan we can give zakat we can give um, islamic social finance through the islamic financial institutions to those who need it so that at least we don't say that we neglect a certain part or segment of the population and in other words we are trying to achieve financial inclusion using that so basically the push has come from the central bank from the top the capacity building exactly i would like to come to you your excellency uh, syria is uh, a market i am not uh, very fully aware of when it comes to islamic banking and finance but i believe uh, islamic banking is uh, at a very initial stage over there so as uh, a regulator uh, what kind of issues you are facing when it comes to capacity building for islamic banks and financial institutions in the country assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh أسعد الله صباحكم جميعا أشكر مصرف البحرين المركزي والسادة المعنيين بالأيوفي وبنك التنمية الإسلامي على الاستضافة بما يخص موضوع الفقر التي نتحدث بها التي تخص الموارد البشرية لا يخفى على أحد أن موضوع الموارد البشرية في المؤسسات المالية الإسلامية يعاني من نقص بالخبرات والمؤهلات المطلوبة بشكل خاص لهذا النوع من الصناعة المالية المصرفية وهو مختلف عن طبيعة المصارف التقليدية أو المؤسسات المالية التقليدية بالتالي هذا الافتقار لهذا النوع من الخبرات والكوادر يرتب أو يعرض المؤسسات المالية الإسلامية لمخاطر تشغيلية عالية ناجمة عن عدم المعرفة بهذا النوع والخبرة بهذا النوع من الصناعة ويرتب عليها أيضا مخاطر سمعة ناتجة عن عدم الالتزام بأحكام ومعايير الرقابة الشرعية بالتالي يتوجب على اعتبار أن العنصر البشري هو أحد أهم عناصر أو أسباب نجاح المؤسسات يتوجب على المؤسسات المالية المصرفية الاستثمار المدروس في التدريب وتطوير الكادر أو العاملين لديها في عدة مجالات سواء بفقه المعاملات أو المحاسبة المالية الإسلامية أو التحكيم إدارة المخاطر الأسواق المالية الإسلامية التكنولوجيا وغيرها من المجالات التي يتوجب أن تتوفر في المؤسسات المالية الإسلامية حتى يستطيع العاملين فيها الوصول إلى المهام الموكلة بهم بدقة وكفاءة ونزاهة ويتناسب مع التطور الذي يحدث بهذا النوع من الصناعة أعتقد أن من أحد أسباب هذا الواقع الذي نعاني منه جهة نقص الخبرة والمعرفة بهذا النوع من أو نقص المعرفة لدى الكادر البشري بهذا النوع من الصناعة يعود لعدة أسباب منها اعتماد المؤسسات المالية الإسلامية على الخبرات الوافدة إليها من المؤسسات التقليدية هذا الاعتماد على الوافدين من المؤسسات التقليدية هذا الكادر البشري الآتي من المؤسسات التقليدية ليس لديه المعرفة بطبيعة وعقود وخدمات ومنتجات المؤسسات المالية الإسلامية وآلية تطبيقة يمكن ليس لديه المعرفة بكيفية إعداد القوائم المالية بما تتناسب مع أحكام الشريعة الإسلامية هذا الاعتماد على الكادر الوافد من المؤسسات التقليدية قد يكون أحد أسباب عدم توفر الخبرة الخبرة في أو نقص الكادر الذي يتمتع فيه الموظفين بالمؤسسات المالية الإسلامية من أحد الأسباب أيضا هو أعتقد عدم وجود التأهيل الكافي للخريجين من قبل الجامعات أو المؤسسات التعليمية بمجال العمل المصرفي الإسلامي هذا أيضا قد يحد من قدرة هذه الخبرات على اكتساب المؤهل المطلوب للعمل بالصناعة المالية الإسلامية 
أيضا نقطة أخيرة ممكن من أهم الأسباب هو تأخر استصدار الشهادات المهنية المتخصصة في مجال عمل المالي الإسلامي مثلا نحن في سوريا تأخرنا في استصدار هذا الشهادات مثل المراقب المصري في المعتمد المدقق الشرعي المحاسب القانوني الإسلامي المتخصص في الأسواق المالية المتخصص في الصناعة المصرفية يوجد لدينا شركة خاصة واحدة تتعاون مع منظمات منظمات دولية لاستصدار هذه الشهادة تأخر استصدار هذه الشهادات يحد الكادر البشري من الوصول إلى المعرفة المطلوبة بالتالي التأهيل المطلوب التي يتوجب توفره في المؤسسات المالية الإسلامية ولكن يوجد نقطة مهمة يتوجب الإشارة إليها أن الأيوفي على اعتبار أن المرجع الأهم اليوم في مجال الصناعة المعايير التي تصدر عنها تعتبر الأهم في مجال العمل المصرفي الإسلامي سهلت كثيرا على المؤسسات التعليمية موضوع التدريب والتأهيل على اعتبار يوجد اليوم معايير موجودة يمكن العودة إليها معتمدة من قبل السلطات الرقابية والمصارف المركزية ممكن سواء بشكل إلزامي أو بشكل استرشادي يمكن العودة إليها وبالتالي يوجد مرجع يمكن العودة إليه من قبل مؤسسات تعليمية لتدريب هذا الكادر وتأهيله بشكل مناسب. Thank you very much. One important thing which I think I would like to take from this conversation, I would like to go to Dr. Syed Nazmi. There are two universities represented on this panel, INSEAD. and uh, Hamad bin Khalaf, Khalifa University. We find that the graduates at INSEE, they are uh, everywhere now. Right? However, uh, we haven't found that kind of penetration uh, by Hamad bin Khalifa University. I think it's primarily because of your very strong focus on research and less on the training side. Uh, your university is very academic uh, in its uh, focus. Uh, so the graduates of your university, what is your experience? Are they getting into Islamic banks and financial institutions or uh, they are going for PhDs and uh, some other professions which are indirectly related with Islamic banking and finance? Because uh, the, the capacity building uh, issues which the institutions are facing they are reacting to these issues by way of having their internal training programs, which is making the uh, relevance of universities less and less. So how would a university like uh, Muhammad bin Khalifa University react to this new trend in the market? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulil kareem. First of all, I would like to thank you, Ayofisa, you know, organization of conf inviting me to, to this conference and organizing this wonderful event and my special thanks to brother Umar Ansari and to Dr. Ridwan Ahmed and yes indeed after almost like um, um, a few years of gap actually we are interacting with professor Dr. Himan Dar. thank you very much uh, for um, having me in this panel uh, with regard to Hamad bin Khalifa University we have a master's program and a PhD program in Islamic finance. But the bigger question is like this, uh, that in my opinion, it's not only Hamad bin Khalifa University, but also my previous university institution that I worked for 20 years, you know, I had the same set of experience. It's somehow there is a, there is a disconnect between the education and the practice. I mean, our graduates, you know, no matter where, you know, I mean, they are coming from, it seems like uh, they're not able to absorb by the market. Especially I'm talking about the master's degree holders. That's a targeted degree for the industry. But unfortunately, I have not seen a single institution come to the institution to recruit, just like what we see, you know, in the conventional finance. But today we are here actually, we're talking about the Sharia governance. We're talking about the Sharia auditors. That's something very good. I'm very pleased to see so many auditors here. They have graduated from various, from various universities and received the certification from IOFI, which is wonderful. I'm so happy to see that, you know, at least that certification is working and we should all endorse. And I would definitely, definitely, you know, give my full, you know, uh, I mean, endorsement to the IOFIS, you know, 
uh, education board for tailoring that kind of you know fellowship program but when it comes to Islamic finance master's degree we don't have that I mean I know that uh, perhaps uh, there is a way the, the people may feel that you know we are too academic we are not taking uh, I mean uh, approach to practical approach or we are not graduating the students are really uh, suitable for the market but that's that's a very important question to ask but we are constantly looking into it and sometimes what happens you know some programs are slowly slowly departing from Islam and having only the finance and there is also you know this danger is happening too because we are becoming too much of finance because we see that the, the in industry is looking for people to work for them or mostly for the key position they are coming from the financial sector conventional financial sector and they are not coming from Islamic finance even in, in among the audience we see the top positions have been occupied and the majority of them they don't have the master's degree in Islamic finance where would the graduates of Islamic finance will go if that is the case I mean our students here at Hamad Al Khalifa University, about 70% of our students are coming from the industry, actually, they're part-time students. So that means uh, the 30%, they are not, you know, coming from the working, in, you know, I mean, they are not, you know, they are not sponsored by, the, by any bank, by any institution. They look for a job and we are not able to place them. And of course, we also encourage our students and those who want to become, you know, audit, you know, Sharia auditor. So they have been uh, up, given the opportunity, and we work closely with IOFI also on this matter. We have a number of, you know, our graduates also they have certification from IOFI. So there is definitely, I mean, on the practical side, you know, we 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 have we do have as a part of the sh the graduate program uh, for a six months you know, internship to work in the banks to get a practical experience. But still, I've, we feel that, you know, they somehow our graduates are finding difficult uh, time in finding the appropriate positions. I think uh, this is a general kind of uh, reaction to the university education anywhere in the world. So you are not the only one, so don't feel disheartened by that one. You know, former Prime Minister of Britain, Tony Blair, his son graduated from Oxford with a degree in classics. He got an internship in investment banking for six months, and afterwards he became a very successful investment banker. And he was the one who said, I proved the university system useless. Someone studying at one of the best universities, classics, and going into investment. Since then, he has started an internship program, which was valued uh, last year, I think, about 250 million pounds. And uh, this is probably the future of uh, education, future of training, future of capacity building, going directly to what is the requirement of doing a job. Bank to Liban uh, actually was part of a very interesting project which gave birth to Islamic finance qualification, IFQ, by Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment, which became probably the best entry-level qualification uh, offered by any institution in the world. So given your experience and exposure to capacity building right from the beginning, what do you think of what are the issues facing the industry when it comes to capacity building, especially with reference to Sharia? I'm asking with reference to Sharia because there is now, I think, an overemphasis on Sharia training. And as a result of that, we are ignoring a lot of other uh, issues like you know, risk management. Uh, uh, regulation is another important area where uh, uh, capacity building institutions are focused, but the operations, product development and structuring, for the last 10 years there is uh, a kind of downplay on that. But let us uh, listen to you, Brother Firas, when it comes to capacity.
capacity building for Islamic financial institutions in Lebanon. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you for your question. Uh, as you mentioned, we started in Lebanon with IFQ and it became popular and uh, even we have uh, more levels coming and uh, with yesterday we were in a visit uh, to BIBF, they started also IFQ level 2 with CISI. Um, it's very important to have capacity building, but the thing is that we sometimes are focusing on specific level. We may have to think more on another level. You see, when we started IFQ, we were responding to the market needs. We would uh, see what market needs we have and we uh, started by, uh, by uh, IFQ. What we see now is the need is going more to a higher level, not just to uh, entry level or middle management level. Uh, with a new focus and the need on external auditors, on Sharia supervisory boards, and so on, on the higher level, I think uh, now we have to focus more on that level. Uh, IOFI is doing well with uh, uh, the, the certificate it's giving like CISA for uh, auditing and to help in this uh, matter, but I think we need more. Right. Uh, and it's on professional level, not just academic level. Academic level is very essential uh, to proceed, but we need more on practical level, even from IOFI. Uh, we have the Sharia uh, audit uh, certificate, but we also have to touch another area, which is related to Sharia governance. You see, Sharia governance is very important, and uh, Ayofi recently uh, went into that more in de into details. Uh, previously, we had a board that from accounting, auditing, and governance all together. Now they split the board. We have the governance board alone and accounting board alone to focus more on governance. And they have even the first ever joint working group uh, between IOFI and IFSB to enhance the work and enhance Sharia governance. And May I ask a question here? You know, Sharia governance. I think okay, this is something which is being overemphasized in the industry, and there is a reason for that one. Sharia governance frameworks as uh, introduced by the central banks. For example, Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates has come up with the Sharia governance framework, which requires the Islamic banks to have Sharia compliance officer. You know, the Sharia compliance function is there. Now, these guys, they have been recruited for Sharia matters, but there is not enough work related with Sharia. So what are they doing now? They are doing trainings. They are trying to make sure that their employers find some value. You know, they are they're giving them salaries on a monthly basis. As a result of that, these guys with Sharia background, they are providing training and they have come up with this capacity building uh, notion, which is all focused on Sharia. Other matters, they have gone into oblivion. They've gone into the background. Okay. Uh, so what is your reaction to this observation of mine and so many other people? Well, uh, there's uh, two ways to, to work with that. Either you go in training and direct capacity building, or you can do another way as a regulator. You can ask to have certificates. So everyone that is working in the market has to have certain kind of certificates. And what that's what we applied in labor. Uh, Bengali bond issued a memo that everyone is, uh, to work on Islamic bank has to have special certificate. Uh, not only Islamic, also convention. But for Islamic specifically, we require more uh, certificates. Uh, like we said, we accepted IFQ, uh, SIPA, uh, SISA, uh, SIBAFI, and all the certificates that are in the market. It is a must. So uh, every individu individu uh, individual would have a certain le level of knowledge before starting work. 
uh, so when you enforce it as a regulator, uh, you cannot work anymore uh, until you have these certificates. All right. Okay, I'll, I'll actually, uh, uh, probably uh, any one of you can answer. Uh, there is huge appreciation for EOP to come up with its own qualifications. And of course, Sibapi, you have your own qualifications as well. I am not sure if uh, IFSD has got any qualification. I, uh, as someone who would like to take a critical view, uh, I they have online online training. IFSD. Uh, online, okay. Uh, so basically, these standard setting bodies directly involved in offering qualifications. I don't think this is a very good system when it comes to governance. These bodies, they should help the industry to develop these qualifications and with the help of INSEE, with the help of universities, even SIPAPI, they should be delivering and marketing these uh, uh, qualifications. Only, only then okay, we would be able to come up with uh, a comprehensive governance framework for capacity building of Islamic financial institutions. Bilal, what is your reaction? Uh, I would like to share one uh, thing, as you have mentioned about IFE. Uh, just a few months back, uh, we had a program with IFE in collaboration, where we had, uh, uh, you know, that IFE they have uh, uh, standards on ethics. So we had a technical workshop. Uh, it was jointly organized between uh, CBAFI and also IFE. And the purpose of having this is that we can go in collaboration and we can train our uh, Islamic finance professionals and to, uh, to give them a view of the ethics, how they can practice those standards and ethics in their Islamic financial institutions. So th this is one way that we can collaborate, as Sepsir mentioned, that uh, with other um, standard setting bodies, perhaps with IFSP also, and uh, so on and so forth. I mean, we, we can do a lot of things in that. But it, it, don't you think uh, there is a need for coming up with a global body focusing on resource development and capacity building, and before then doing some research as well. You know, as an observer of, of the industry, uh, about 10 years back, one institution, I won't name it, it came up uh, with this figure that there is a need for between 40,000 to 400,000 personnel required for Islamic banking and finance over the next 10 years. As a result of that, these poor guys, they were registering themselves for Islamic finance courses here and there. When they graduated, there was nothing. And this is something you alluded, uh, Dr. Sayyid Nazim. These guys, they come out of the universities, they go to Islamic banks, and they don't find any jobs. Uh, so don't, don't you think that you know, there is a need for this global body which should actually assess the human resource development needs of the industry and recommend the response to this one by different bodies on a regional level, global level, and national level as well. I'm asking you. Uh, well, let's start. Uh, when you, you talk about these certificates that issued by uh, standard setting bodies, it is not a startup level. You see, uh, you pass through before in different studies, in uh, academic studies and so on. This is pure professional. And it is uh, kind of creating a trust when it's done by, uh, by uh, these bodies. It's, it's creating uh, a trust that this person knows the standards very well and he's uh, capable of applying it at that time. So it, it is out of market need. So to uh, respond to market need, you need such a uh, certificate. It's not a substitute of the other studies. When you reach this level, you already pass through different certificates. And here, you're just taking a stamp to say, I am ready to the market. I know these standards. I'm, I can apply it very, very well. So it's not a target for IOFI to have the certificate rather to help the industry to go on and to help them for capacity building. It no, I agree actually. Basically, I don't have any issue with an IOFI qualification. What I was referring to was the delivery. 
the delivery should be done by the other training providers. Yeah, uh, the delivery usually, uh, I'm talking on behalf of IOFI now, the delivery usually doesn't necessarily uh, being done uh, via IOFI. So they have like uh, MOUs and uh, agreements with uh, different uh, institutions to do so. For example, yesterday, uh, Bank de Levan signed a, an MOU uh, with IOFI. One part of it is that we help in uh, okay. this matter. We have a training department, and they can help in this matter. N not necessarily IOFI do the training, the, the, uh, just the program and certificate, but uh, uh, who will do the training and deliverable and explanation and so on would be a, uh, another party from different countries. Excellent. That's uh, Dr. Sayyid Nazim would you like to add? Assalamu alaikum. Actually, I, I know that um, we, we have been talking about, when we talk about the capacity building, you know, we talked about mostly about the Islamic financial professionals, Islamic finance professionals. And also we have touched upon the, the auditors, uh, the audits, you know, internal auditor or external auditor and et cetera. But what about the Sharia experts themselves? Don't you think that we need to build the capacity to have more Sharia scholars? And Sharia scholars is not a skill. It's a qualification. It's a knowledge that they, they, they acquired it through the hard work over years. That's something that we're lacking in this industry. We have so many programs for masters and PhD in Islamic finance. I just mentioned, I don't want to over mention again. And I also mentioned about that there is one layer of you know, expertise, which is the Sharia auditors. MashaAllah, IOFI has done an extra, extraordinary job. But what about the Sharia scholars? Can they be some kind of you know, certification or someone has position, you know, I mean, like, you know, necessary knowledge can come to an organization and get that certified Sharia scholar to work in an Islamic bank. Something like that, you know, some, something which is lacking when you talk about capacity building. I just had one um, thing uh, with your permission, uh, Professor Dar, I will I'll mention. 20 years ago, uh, at the Harvard University Forum, um, the U.S. Treasury Under Secretary John Taylor gave a groundbreaking opening speech. In that speech, he said, "Islamic banking and Islamic finance are absolutely legitimate businesses, as long as they strictly follow governance and regulation." He said further, "He, it is an extra layer of governance. It is an extra layer of governance, which is the Sharia governance." that contributes further towards making the system a foolproof mechanism. So you can see such a strong you know, statement is coming from US regulator uh, saying that you know, the Sharia and Sharia governance, Sharia scholars, they are the backbone, they are the gatekeeper of this industry. Whatever we are today, it's because of the Sharia scholars' hard work. So I think this is where we need to put some more emphasis. All right, okay, I think also this, this is a fair point. Uh, can we have this one question for, uh, from the uh, middle of the hall? Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Sheikh Ibrahim Lethome from Kenya. I am the chairman of the Sharia board of one of the largest banks there with us, a window, an Islamic window. First of all, I appreciate this discussion and talking about the challenges, especially on human capacity or human resource. This is real. And I want to believe this conference is about discussing Islamic finance in real time, and also the real issues affecting us. From the part of the world I come from, besides the disruptions called, caused by COVID-19, I was just talking to my friend here, asking him, when you see the word disruptive times, what comes into your mind? He's a professor in the university, and he told me COVID-19. I told him from where I sit, there is a bigger problem a bigger disruption than that. People creating violence in the world in the name of Islam. Where I come from, the moment you mention the word Sharia and you're a Muslim, 
If you are a small one, they see a potential terrorist. If you are a young person, they see a current terrorist. If you are an old one like me, they see a retired terrorist. So there is the issue of correcting misconceptions. Tasheehil mafahim. It's a big challenge, and I think this conference must discuss how we need to overcome that challenge. I appreciate build the capacity, universities and the rest, but in some places in this world, you graduate with a, I am a Sharia graduate from International Islamic University, but I have to explain to myself and explain to the world that I represent people who respect the law. Because there are people out there, in the name of Islam, are they are killing others. So I would like this also to be discussed as one of the disrupt uh, disruptions to Islamic finance. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is basically a comment, okay. you know, creating awareness about Islamic finance so that uh, there, there are no confusions about uh, the practice. This is an important thing as well, especially in case of Nigeria, in case of Ethiopia, and other countries where Muslims are not in big majority. Hence, even in, in, in Nigeria and Ethiopia, the term interest-free banking is preferred by the regulators rather than Islamic. I would like uh, to allow you to ask this question, but rather quickly, I would be finishing this at 11, uh, half past. I need to talk about one. Yes, but let me ask uh, the gentleman. السلام عليكم شكرا جزيلا التعقيد بس على ما قالته الاستاذه ميسا والدكتور ناظم في موضوع اهميه الموارد البشريه او اهميه المخاطر السمعه المشكله عندنا فعلا ان احنا نعاني منها من الصناعه المصرفيه الاسلاميه هي الموارد البشريه التي لديها القدره على اقناع العميل لديها القدره الذاتيه ان هي مقتنعه اصلا بالعالم المصرفي الاسلامي ودي مشكله صدفناها في كثير جدا من الدول كيفيه اعداد موارد بشريه لتقديم هذه الصناعه. المشير الاكبر كمان ان احنا بنتعرض لمخاطر السمعه الريبيتيشن ريسك دي مع على مستوى الصناعه كلها لان العميل لا يقتنع بما يقدمه الموظف او الموارد البشريه اللي شغاله جوه البنك لعدم اقتناعه الشخص بيها. اضافه لان كمان المؤهلين لهذه الموارد البشريه اللي هم مدربين اصبح النهارده دخل الصناعه مجموعه من مجرد العاملين، مجرد مواجدينها عباره عن شغل وليست رساله مهنيه انه يخش يضرب يروح يقرا مثلا عفوا كتاب او يقرا مرجع ويرجع يقول انا مدرب في المصرفيه الاسلاميه لا ينقل الخبرات دكتور سيد بيتكلم ناظم بيتكلم على اهميه الخبرات العمليه التي تنقل للاخرين دي مش موجوده حاليا دلوقتي ودي اللي بنعاني منها على المستوى اعتقد ان احنا محتاجين الى زي ما قال الاستاذ ميسه والدكتور سيد واخونا فراس اهميه اعداد صف جيل قادر على تقديم هذه الصناعه بصوره عمليه مع تطويرها بالصوره المباشره شكرا جزيلا Thank you. Thank you very much. You want to say? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I want to go back to the point that was raised: the need for capacity building on, on the level of the scholar. Yeah, it's a major point. And uh, my my opinion is that uh, need is the mother of creativity. Now, what is happening with Sharia governance and uh, the point that I raised, that the work group between IFSB and IOFI is trying to set uh, guidelines for regulators, and regulators must help in that, to set limitation on numbers to Sharia boards. How can someone go into Sharia board, and what number of Sharia board he can be uh, in it, so to, crea to create uh, a need, more need for the scholars yeah. uh, and not just rely on the expert scholars that we have and we uh, we have the honor to work with them but we need a new generation yeah. to work on that and I think uh, that will happen if regulators started to put some rules uh, to help in that area. That's right, in the Sharia governance frameworks, they address this thing. Uh, but actually, there is, in certain markets, there is no oversupply of Sharia scholars in the market. 
it's only the the frontier markets where Islamic banking and finance is new, we find this uh, issue of uh, shortage of Sharia scholars. And I think mobility of Sharia scholars is more important. Uh, creation of new Sharia scholars, probably we have come to the, a stage where we have a lot of Sharia scholars. Aisha, you want to say something? Yes. We have only seven minutes to go. So to answer your question, actually, what we need to understand is the nature of Sharia governance at this moment because it is never static and it is something evolving. If you look at the historical context, we understand that at first it started with having a mere Sharia supervisory board. And then we wanted to have a Sharia compliance officer. And then we understood that it's not one or two men's job and we wanted to integrate that with the functions. We have the internal control functions of the financial institutions. And today we have come to a place where in some countries, it has become a legal compliance uh, duty with, which is already mentioned in the statute. For example, if you look at Malaysia, according to section 28 of IFSA, if you don't comply with the duty to Sharia compliance, you can be jailed for a term of eight years or you can be fined for 25 million ringgit, so you can be even imposed both punishments. So we understand that it is not something static and as long as it's evolving and there's diversity of it in different countries, we can't have one central focal point to dictate this is what is good for the whole industry and this is the capacity building for the whole industry. So I believe that we have not come to that point where uniformity is achieved when it comes to the practical aspect of Sharia governance. Until then, diversity is important and today we have come to a place where we need to talk about Sharia supervisory board diversity not only about um, the female participation or gender diversity, but age diversity is also important, and professionalism, diversity, and we need to get more people from different backgrounds to sit on the Sharia committees, so that at least whatever the deliberations we make will be a collective effort to serve the maqasid sharia approach of the industry rather than taking a rule-based approach. So Excellent. Diversity to, is important. To cut right? the long story short, I don't think we are ready to have a central place yet until we achieve uniformity across the whole globe. Excellent. And that will be achieved the day we can compete with conventional finance. All right. Okay. There is one uh, question for you. No. Quick one so, in 30 seconds. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Ashraf al-Musaleen. Wa ba'd, yani, min al-Mu'sif, yani, ba'd, كل هذه المدة من نشاط المصارف والبنوك الإسلامية وهذه البرامج برامج تأهيل المتوافرة أن نستمع يعني إلى ما نحن بصدده الآن من هذا الإشكال في تأهيل الموارد البشرية العاملة لدى البنوك الإسلامية أظن أن المشكلة يعني ليست في التأهيل الآن إذا كان كنا نتحدث عن المشكلة فلعلنا لابد أن نحددها بذاتها وأظنها هي في غياب الإرادة والرغبة والاهتمام بهذا التأهيل ودور هذا التأهيل في تحقيق هذه المقاصد التي كنا نذكرها فإذا البحث يكون في حل هذه المشكلة بذاتها لأنه لا يعقل بعد هذه المدة الطويلة من نشاط المصرف الإسلامية ونحن نكرر في الموضوع نفسه يعني مشكلة التأهيل يعني لأنه إذا ما حلناش مشكلة الإرادة الحقيقية لدى هذه البنوك فلا نحول مشكلة التأهيل سيبقى الموضوع متكررا ومتعاقبا عبر السنوات نحن طبعا ربما نأتيكم يعني من تجربة وهي تجربة ليست رائدة ولكنها أتمناها أن تكون واعدة في مجال النشاط المصرفي الإسلامي والتجربة الجزائرية اليوم طبعا حاصل أنه الحمد لله توفر هذه المؤسسات المتعددة والتي تقدم مثل هذه البرامج فضلا على فكرة التنسيق مع الجامعات في شهادات الجامعية لأن هذه الشهادات الجامعية لا نريدها أن تكون شهادات نظرية صرفة وإنما تكون ملتبطة بالعمل التطبيقي والتنفيذي والمهني فكان لكثير من البنوك الإسلامية هذا التنسيق مع الجامعات في برامج سواء كان في شهادات الماستر أو الدكتوراه بما يوفر يعني هؤلاء المؤهلين لمثل هذا النشاط فلذلك يعني أظن أننا لابد أن نحدد محل المشكل وأن نضع أسبوعان عليه وأكتفي بهذا شكرا so basically, you know, look, we are coming to the end of our session. Uh, so we would like to summarize the thing. So we have identified a definite need for capacity building for Islamic banks and financial institutions. 
with a special reference to Sharia law. There, we, there was a suggestion that you know, there should be more done to create Sharia scholarship. I made my point that you know, we already have a lot of Sharia scholars now. In about 25 years uh, back, you know, Financial Times came up with this uh, statement that there is dearth of Sharia scholars in Islamic banking and finance. That's not the case anymore. Certain countries where Islamic banking and finance is at an initial stage, there, yes, okay, we need Sharia scholars with exposure to Islamic banking and finance. Oman, for example, about 10 years back, you know, there was this case, but not anymore. They have the local Sharia scholars. In the UAE, okay, you know, we used to have uh, Sharia scholars going from other parts of the world to the UAE, but now they have their own local Sharia scholars as well, here in Bahrain and everywhere. Malaysians, for example, they have a new generation of their Sharia scholars. So when it comes to the generation or creation of new Sharia scholars, I think the industry has taken uh, uh, a very good approach and there is an outcome uh, to that as well. The issues regarding this last comment that you know, we uh, should be doing something on a practical level and the universities should uh, develop programs and degrees which are more applied, I don't think this has happened in the conventional domain. The universities would like to do the, the things the way they have been doing it. It's only what happens after the degree. So if we can have a global internship, again my word, global internship program, maybe initiated by AOAP or other standard setting bodies, which should allow these degree holders or qualification holders to have exposure to the realities of Islamic banking and finance, different practices, that would enhance the, uh, 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 the quality of human resources available to the industry. Uh, and of course, the, the role for AOFP, IFSB, SIBAKI and other uh, bodies, this is very, very important over here. And I think in our panel, we would like to recommend that these institutions should collaborate and uh, come up with a combined collaborative approach to capacity building for human, uh, for Islamic banks and financial institutions we should not be looking for multilateral institutions like Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, World Bank, and so on, that they should be pouring money into capacity building with respect to Islamic banks and financial institutions in their member countries. This is something which these institutions have done. We should be thankful to them. However, this is now the time that the industry as a whole should own this project of creating the required human resources for Islamic banking and finance to take it to the next level. I would like to thank my panelists. They have contributed uh, ably and significantly to, to this panel. And uh, you have taken your time to come from different parts of the world. I, on behalf of AOAP, would like to thank you again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Hamayandar, for chairing the, one of the most important panel discussion that we had today. I'm sure we, um, we touched upon a number of different fronts um, on, on, the, on the topic of capacity building, and inshallah the discussion will move forward um, in, in, in respect of, in particular, on Sharia governance um, at, the, at the topic. Uh, when it comes to capacity building. So I would like to thank you all for being with us. You, you know, it, it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much for traveling far and wide. Perhaps we can have a group picture uh, before you leave the stage. I would like to thank um, Her Excellency Ms. Maisa Sabreen, First Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Syria, Brother Firas Hamdan, member of AOFI Accounting Board, Executive Director of Human Resource at uh, Bank du Liban, Central Bank of Lebanon, Professor Dr. Sayyid Nadim Ali, Director of Research Division at College of Islamic Studies, Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar. Dr. Aishat Muniza, Chairperson at Capital Market Sharia Advisory Council, Capital Market, uh, Capital Market Development Authority in Maldives, and a professor at NCF. Dr. Muhammad Bilal, Research Economist at, at Sibafi in Bahrain, and the Chairperson of the session, 
Professor Dr. Humayunda, Director General, Cambridge Institute of Islamic Finance in the UK. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, we do have a, uh, a, a coffee and a prayers break um, now. We have about 30 minutes before we start our next session, which is uh, a very important one, in particular when it comes to Islamic finance windows. The coffee, uh, as usually, served outside. The, the prayer rooms are uh, upstairs, as well as you can pray in the, in the, in the VIP lounge, um, which is just outside the, this main hall. So we'll see you back, inshallah, in about 30 minutes. If we can request all of you to be back on time. We do have some interesting stuff uh, later on. We do have a presentation on, an, uh, on Islamic alternative benchmark rate, and then followed by a very important panel discussion. Thank you very much. Getting old, man. You know, it's, it's, it's wired. It's oh, wired. okay. It's wired. That is not wired, right? That is wired as well. This is the, this is the best you can do? Yes. Okay, can I just see? After lunch. Or during lunch. After lunch. Maybe. Yeah, can you tell? Uh, <laughs> So it's better if I have the. I want to see. to see it here. As ISDB, we ensure no one is left behind. We are one. Facing unprecedented human challenges, one voice of many in this decade of action. Together, 
we can achieve our shared sustainable development goals and a prosperous future for generations to come. Back. This, hello. Hello, hello. قصة النجاح اللي صارت ويعيشها بيت التمويل الكويتي اليوم بدت من سنة 77 لما تقرر تأسيس أول بنك إسلامي الكويتي وبدأ منها التاريخ خطواته الثابتة لأهداف الأكبر ويكسب ثقة مساهمين وعملاء أكثر وأكثر وبدأ يكبر وتكبر معاه الإنجازات ويقود المؤسسات المالية في ابتكار وتنوع الخدمات سواء اللي قدمها للأفراد أو الشركات تعدى نجاح بيت التمويل حدود الكويت وبدت خطة التوسع والانتشار دول مختلفة في الوطن العربي وآسيا وأوروبا وتحول من أول بنك إسلامي بالكويت إلى واحد من أكبر البنوك الإسلامية بالعالم ولأن بيتك عاصر جميع الأجيال ولأن بيتك يسعى للتطور في كل مجال يقدم بيت التمويل اليوم نقلة نوعية في الخدمات المصرفية الرقمية والتحول السريع لدخول عصر جديد مع مواصلة الالتزام بالعمل وفق الشريعة الإسلامية كان ولا زال بيت التمويل الكويتي على قمة المؤسسات المالية الإسلامية بالعالم حين تجد أفكارك بعدها المثالي تصبح واقعا حين توافق خطواتك أرض صلبة تحقق حلمك حين تدعم شجاعتك فرصة تأخذك أبعد مما تتخيل معا نتقدم ونجعل للغد معنا البنك الأهلي السعودي معا نصنع الغد Testing. Check one. This one. This. Check. Yes. 
This. This. Didi Kapuru operates 